my friends. Thank you so much for coming to spend part of your April 20th me. All right, let's start that over back to one. Thank you so much for coming to spend part of your April 20th, 2024 with me. Today is 420. Uh, if you know, you know. So happy 420 to those of you who celebrate. It's also a really great day because today is the start of the Stanley Cup playoffs. And guess what? All of our teams are in the playoffs. Rangers play tomorrow, facing their first game at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern against the Capitals. The Bruins play tonight, right? Bruins are, Bruins are playing tonight at 8 p.m. Eastern against Toronto Maple Leafs and the Islanders at 5 p.m. So, Scott, if you're here, I know you have to watch that game. I tried to schedule it around, but we won't be done by 5 p.m. We just won't. And you guys are playing the Canes. So, good luck. And anyone else who's a hockey fan, feel free to chime in and tell us who your team is. Because we love hockey here. <laughs> and we love the Grateful Dead. And if you know, you know. And also, the CU Buffs. There's my CU Boulder Buffs. Neon sign. I'm a proud alum of the University of Colorado in Boulder and the University of Denver Law School. So yeah, everyone's rooting for their team. Awesome. Mm. So my friends, here we are. After three days of jury selection, we have 12 seated jurors in the Karen Reed case out of Norfolk County, Massachusetts in Dedham at the Norfolk Superior Court which is the same courthouse that tried Sacco and Vanzetti. It's a very historical courthouse. The trial did not start yet. Uh, did this just start? This just started. A few minutes, I was a few minutes late. I was I just lost track of time. We have some motions to go over that were filed last minute. We have some discovery exchanges uh, from the Commonwealth that were just exchanged during jury selection. And what I thought would be very interesting to do in my rabbit hole, you know, I get call me Alice. I have unearthed the footage of Karen's original arraignment on February 2nd of 2022. I want to watch that with you because it's very interesting. And I also want to look at some of the original news coverage that came out right around that time. For those of you who are just joining, we are covering the Karen Reed case. And Karen Reed is accused of secondary murder in the death of her boyfriend, Boston police officer John O'Keefe, in the early morning hours of January 29th of 2022. That is what, what the Commonwealth alleges. Commonwealth alleges that Karen Reed dropped her boyfriend, Officer John O'Keefe, off at 34 Fairview, which is the home of another Boston police officer, backed into him in a rage and left him to die in the snow. The defense says Karen Reed dropped John O'Keefe off at 34 Fairview. She went home. He went into the house. Something happened. And the next morning when she couldn't find him, she went back to the house at 34 Fairview with two other people, Jennifer McCabe and Carrie Roberts. And Officer John O'Keefe was lying outside in the snow. He was taken to Good Samaritan Medical Center where he was pronounced dead about an hour and change later. The cause of death is blunt force trauma to the head and hypothermia. And the manner of death, according to the death certificate, is undetermined. We have been covering this case together since I think January of this year. And I have at least 50 hours of coverage on it and analysis, if not more during which I have analyzed with you official court documents, official police reports, official investigative reports, photographs, motions. We've analyzed the hearings. Everything that I report about on this channel comes from actual court documents. 
So don't believe everything that you we that you read on Twitter if you're new here. And for those who are hate tweeting me, thank you. Thank you for getting my name out there and for giving people a place to come and watch this coverage in a place where my moderators are the best on YouTube. And I do have more than 50 hours, Kat, huh? I think I do. I think you're right. A safe place to watch this coverage, a safe place to chat, because my moderators are the best. Many of them are retired law enforcement, and we just don't tolerate foul language, personal attacks, trash talk. This is not Twitter. This is YouTube. And this is my channel. So to that woman who is finding it her life's mission to keep posting clips of my shows on Twitter and trashing me and telling me that I owe Officer O'Keefe's family an apology, uh, to you I say, find a hobby because you're not going to shut me up. And to John Officer to Officer John O'Keefe's family, I say, I am sorry. I am so sorry for what you're going through. I am so sorry that you lost a son who everyone in his life considered to be a great human being, a wonderful, generous guy, a, an upstanding brother in blue, a police officer that so many respected and not only did you lose John, but you lost your daughter as well. And when your daughter died and then her, her, her husband died something like three months later, your son John took custody of her two children and was raising them for eight years as his own. And I am so, so sorry for what you're going through. It breaks my heart. It really does. And I'm sorry for what you're enduring. I can't imagine losing one child, but let alone losing two. It's, it's just, it's heartbreaking. But I am not going to apologize for my coverage of this case because we have looked at all the documents. We have looked at the injuries and this is not a neutral channel, okay? I am not a cupcake. I can't make everyone happy. I've had that pink sign on my wall since I became a mother, and I am a mother of five, there is no time in history that all five of my children are happy at the same time. I can't make everyone happy. And if you don't like the coverage that you're getting here, you don't need to trash talk me on Twitter or Facebook or wherever it is that you live instead of having a life. What you need to do is go somewhere else and watch it. I'm not going to apologize for that. I'm just not. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much to those of you who choose to watch this case with me because it's facts. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Keep stating the facts loud and proud. I, I'm not, you're not going to scare me away from reporting on this case, okay? I'm a New York lawyer. You're not going to scare me. And I have something else to play for you tonight because I think Ashley Banfield might be turning the corner on this case too. Um, <laughs> you had five kids. Can you return any of them? That's funny. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being a huge fan. Um, listen, it, it, the YouTube streets are mean. It's mean out here. Jack says, it's hard to believe people. It's heartbreaking. And a daughter died. Oh, I'm so sorry. 1992 from leukemia. It's terrible. Don't you want the truth? Yeah. I'm so sorry, Jackie. No, no parent should ever lose a child. That's just not the way it's supposed to go. But it's not the order of things. And I am so, 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 so sorry. Um, thank you. Thank you, Morale Ms. C. Morales. That Brandy and I have been respectful. We are going to do gavel to gavel on this trial. I think Brandy and I, we haven't discussed the schedule yet, but we're going to split it. I think we're going to do it together. And I think we're going to stream it on both channels. So I'm here for it. I'm this invested in this case so far that I am not <laughs> stepping away from this case now. And at least you know that you're going to have the safe place to watch the coverage. Um, it's a, it's rough out there, you guys. It is a rough, rough YouTube world, and it's a rough Twitter world. And just don't go there. Just don't go there. Yeah, exactly, Angela Marie. They're trying to cancel Ted Daniel because he wore a pink shirt. Chat's moving quickly. Um, so it's not, it's not happening. And I'm not getting involved in the drama. And I'm not going on there to debate with anybody who wants to, you know, poke at me. Just not, I'm just not going to do it. I'm not, I'm not responding to these people on Twitter. I refuse to engage with them. I refuse to even give them 
uh, the dignity of a response because they're just looking for attention and they're not going to get it from me. So that's where it is. And that's what I'm saying. And that is my story and I'm sticking to it. But trust me when I tell you the agita that I get every morning when I get up and look at my Twitter notifications is kind of making it not worth it. But it is worth it because I think we all want to know the truth of what happened that night. And I think based on our analysis of everything that we have seen, that car did not hit John O'Keefe. And John O'Keefe was not hit by a car. And yeah, I got that from a hearing. I read that. We watched it. I'm repeating it. I'm not paid by the defense. Please stop spewing nonsense that you think that I'm paid PR for the defense. I am not. I've never met anyone in this case, despite the Twittiots seemingly thinking that I was on vacation with Alan Jackson in Cancun at the Dave Matthews concerts. That is a lie. <laughs> that is not true. I don't know where they dream these things up, but I don't get, get, get a hobby, get a job. I just can't even, I, I, I just I can't. But anyway, let's, uh, we're doing this today. We have some motions to go over. We have some old coverage to look at. And I think that you will agree with me that in the beginning of this case, there were some things that were misreported by the media and in court. So we're going to look at uh, what Lally had to say during the initial court appearance of Karen Reed, February 2nd of 2022. Thank you, Michelle. She says, thank you for honoring the O'Keefe family and for putting the facts out there. You are humongous cover up and the truth will come out. Hopefully the court is not corrupt like the police force. I, you know, every day, and that's why on my thumbnail, I have a picture of the Twilight Zone logo because I feel like I'm in the Twilight Zone. I feel like this is so obvious um, and just so the deeper you dig, the more that you will uncover yourself. You don't have to listen to me. Read the court documents and listen to people cover this case who know the facts as set forth in the investigative reports, in the witness statements. We've been through them. There are so many changes and so many edits to those witness statements. And look at the grand jury testimony that we're privy to. And look at the fact that Brian Higgins has flipped and taken a federal proffer. And look at the fact that he went to a military base, Brian Higgins, who was present on 30, at 34 Fairview on the night of this incident, and destroyed his phone and broke his SIM card in, in half. And he's saying that the defense gave him permission to do that, despite the initial court order, which we are going to see the original judge in Stoughton issue in this case. Julie says, I'm a legal assistant 30 years and I love true crime. I've never seen anything like this case. Never. Never. And when people say it's impossible, this couldn't be a cover-up, um, this could never happen. Oh, it's happened. Okay, I am familiar with cover-up at the highest of levels. I was the plaintiff's attorney for at least 50 or 60 victims slash survivors of clergy sex abuse against the Rockville Center Diocese in New York on Long Island. I represented all of those men and women who were abused by priests. And the huge scandal broke in 2002. And you may remember that because it broke in Boston because some amazing reporters uncovered this fraud that had been perpetrated on Catholics for decades. Because when the priests were caught abusing the children, they were, they were shuffled around to other parishes without telling the other parishes, you know, watch out for father so-and-so. In fact, I had one defendant priest who had been deceased who essayed something like 17 of my clients over, I, I can't recall, a 15-year period in all different par parishes. So had they had they reported him the first time, 14 of them never would have been abused. So when I say that I've seen corruption at the highest level, that's one example. I litigated those cases. That was a 15-year fight. And I've also seen it on Long Island when the Suffolk County Chief of Police, James Burke, and the District Attorney at the time, Tom Spoda, both went to prison for covering up a beatdown of a suspect in a police interrogation room. And then the police chief threatened all the officers who were present that if they told X, Y, and Z would happen to them, 
because that suspect found a bag of things in the back seat of the police chief's car that would incriminate him in many ways. And they both spent time in jail. In fact, Tom Spoda is still sitting in jail. So when people say this could never happen, oh, it does happen. And it did happen. And in fact, the Catholic Church scandal had a lot more people covering up than perhaps the people in the Karen Reed case. So it, it just blows my mind when people find this so hard to believe. Because it's not hard to believe. It's really not. But what I want to do first today, since I think we have a lot of people, if you are new to this case, um, I don't know, wave in the chat. Just wave. Shari and Charlie Lynn, thank you for becoming new members. And uh, Truth Seeker, thank you for becoming a new member. And Barb, thanks for your super chat. Barb says, Melanie, thanks for shining light on this controversial case. Praying for the truth to prevail whatever where, wherever the path leads. Thank you, Barb. And um, yeah, a lot of people won't cover this case. They won't. They haven't. Uh, I am. I am. I have spent my 30-year career being the voice of people who had no voice, or voice of people who were afraid to speak. And so, this is just basically a continuation of what I've been doing my entire entire legal career. And I don't. I don't understand why people are afraid of it. I, I don't know. Shari, thanks for your super chat. It took. I took copious amounts of notes from Banfield's video from this past week. She's <laughs> almost. She's almost. I believe 100%. Free Karen Reed. I'm going to show you that clip from last night. I think it was from it was was from last night because uh, it was very interesting to me. And thanks for your super chat. They should fundraise uh, a night with Alan Jackson. <laughs> Jackie, thank you for becoming a member. That KK, thanks for becoming a member. And to Amy L. Twenty Twenty Two, thank you for gifting five memberships. That is a random draw. I have no control over it. You have to opt into gifts. One of the mods will put something in the chat that will let you know how you can opt into that because I'm technologically not very savvy and they know that. <sighs> okay, uh, so some very interesting motions dropped. I'm just going to give you a brief overview of them. We're going to look at them after we look at the original arraignment because I thought it would be so interesting to go back to that. There's a motion to change the seating arrangements of the jury because according to defense counsel, Something like six of the 12 jurors have an obstructed view of the witness. So the witness from, I, let me, I have to just pull this up for a second. The witnesses, it, the jurors are looking at the back of the witness's head during testimony. And that I've never in 30 years seen a courtroom designed that way. And that is completely whack. Like that, the, the jury has to see the witness's face in order to assess their credibility. That's what a jury is doing. The jury is the finder of fact in this case, and the jury needs to assess the credibility of each and every witness. And in order to do that, they need to see the witness's face. So the fact that the configuration of this courtroom has several of the jurors looking at the back of the head of the witness is just, as they say, it's unconstitutional. We'll go through that motion. And so the court suggested that perhaps when the witness was testifying, the witness should turn and face the jury. But in that case, the defendant, Karen Reed, would not be able to see the face of the witness. And under the Constitution, you have the right to confront your accusers, right? That's basic constitutional law. So this is going to be interesting. And I'm not sure turning sideways doesn't help. I don't know. That's a great question. How, how did other trials handle this? I don't know. Uh, and he attaches photos and one of them is in my thumbnail of what the view of the juror would be if you're a concert goer like I am you know that you try and avoid those obstructed view seats because you don't want to try and be watching a concert with a pole in front of you or a hockey game with a pole in front of you uh so it's crazy are there no other courtrooms in that courthouse I know it's a very old courthouse I think it doesn't even have air conditioning because the judge took a break the other day when she asked the court reporter if it if she needed a break. <laughs> this wasn't we watched that too. Mm. Yeah, like watching a game at Fenway. Nobody wants to watch a game at Fenway where you can't see what's happening because you're sitting behind a pole. Right, exactly. 
So we're going to take a look at that. But let's do let's do this first. Let's go to I'm going to show you first some original media coverage of the Karen Reed case. And this is um, this first clip that I have here. It's from CBS Boston, and this aired. This aired on February 1st of 2022. So this was, uh, uh, Officer O'Keefe was found on the 29th. So this was three days after he was found. Just let me know that you can hear this. We begin tonight with breaking news and arrest in the death of a Boston police officer. A woman is now facing manslaughter charges. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Lisa Hughes. And I'm David Wade. Karen Reed is accused of motor vehicle homicide. The body of Officer John O'Keefe was found in the snow early Saturday morning outside of a home in Canton. Now, investigators say she drove him to that neighborhood just after midnight. I-team sources say the two had been in a relationship and that investigators have video from a ring doorbell camera and then impounded her car. Investigators have video from a ring doorbell camera and then impounded her car. This was three days after Officer John O'Keefe's death. This was the day before Karen was hauled into court and arraigned. They claimed to have video from a ring camera and then they impounded her car. I'm gonna rewind that because you need to understand that this is the first thing that the public was told locally in Boston and not only locally in Boston, this, you know how these things spread worldwide on the internet. The Daily Mail in the UK picked this up and it's still out there. You can still find it. We went over that one day. I'm just gonna rewind this a little bit so you can hear that again. Reed is accused of motor vehicle homicide. The body of Officer John O'Keefe was found in the snow early Saturday morning outside of a home in Canton. Now, investigators say she drove him to that neighborhood just after midnight. I-team sources say the two had been in a relationship and that investigators have video from a ring doorbell camera and then impounded her car. Did you hear it? Did you hear a little louder for people in the back? I'm going to let this play out, and then I'm going to show you another news clip. John O'Keefe, again, a 16-year veteran of the Boston Police Department. Boston Police releasing a statement late tonight, reading in part, John was a kind person, dedicated to his family, and will be greatly missed by his co-workers and anyone who had the privilege of meeting him. Officer O'Keefe was off duty at the time of his death. We should learn more about the investigation tomorrow when Karen Reed is arraigned in Stoughton District Court. Lisa. David, breaking news on the breaking news and arrest in the death of a Boston police officer. Okay, here's the second clip. Same channel. Breaking news. Same day. Breaking news and arrest in the death of a Boston police officer. A woman is now facing manslaughter charges. 41-year-old Karen Reed is also accused of motor vehicle homicide and leaving the scene of a deadly collision in Officer John O'Keefe's death. His body was found early Saturday morning in a residential neighborhood in Canton. I-team sources saying the two had been in a relationship and that investigators have video from a ring doorbell camera and they've impounded the suspect's car. John O'Keefe was a 16-year veteran. Did you hear it again? Investigators have video from a ring doorbell camera and have impounded her car. That's what you were told, Boston. That's what you were told. I'm gonna take it back again. O'Keefe was a 16-year veteran of the Boston Police Department, and Reed will be arraigned tomorrow. Homicide by negligent operation of a motor vehicle. Hold on, that did the wrong thing. News and it arrest in the death of a Boston body was found early Saturday morning in a residential neighborhood in Canton. I-team sources saying the two had been in a relationship. Motor vehicle homicide and leaving the scene of a deadly collision in Officer John O'Keefe's death. His body was found early Saturday morning in a residential neighborhood in Canton. I-team sources saying the two 
had been in a relationship and that investigators have video from a ring doorbell camera and they've impounded the suspect's car. Investigators have video from a ring doorbell camera. Everybody who's heard about this case initially, me included, when I initially heard about, oh, there's video of her hitting him with her car. Oh, there's video. They impounded her car. Wow, that's really sad. She was charged with manslaughter, vehicular manslaughter, accident. Really sad. That wasn't good enough for them because they upped the charges. Kevin wants to know what was the reason they upped the charges. After they convened a grand jury sometime, sat for a while, April, May of 2022. In June 2022, she was upgraded to murder charges. Some people think that it's because she didn't take a plea deal. Some people think it's that because she began to talk about the possibility that he died because of a fight inside of that house, that he was beaten and left outside to die. I don't know what the additional evidence, I mean, they found to indicate that this should now be second degree murder and remove it to superior court, remember, because this was originally in district court, right? I'm not a Massachusetts lawyer, so correct me if I'm wrong on the ter terminology, but I know that this was like Stoughton District Court initially. And then with the upcharge, it was moved to superior court and assigned to Judge Canoni, who is an appointed judge. In New York, we elect our judges in state court. Federal court judges are appointed, state court judges are elected. But in Massachusetts, they tell me that your judges are appointed. So Beverly Canoni is an appointed judge who was then assigned to this case in Norfolk County Superior Court. She has since that time that she became attached to this case, been transferred to civil court, but she decided to keep this case. Jean says, I was looking over the upcharge from manslaughter to second degree murder, and I'm 100% convinced it was purposeful to make sure Judge Canoni got the case, even though she wasn't in line to. Bernie says, implying a lot there, misinformation by media. They have questions to answer, to answer too, in my opinion. Yeah, and a lot of people heard this initially, and they're like, oh, open and shut, open and shut. How sad. That's so sad. And Magnolia Gypsy says, they used the blood alcohol content to up the charges, but totally because they wanted a plea. And we're going to see one of the motions today from the Commonwealth wanting to have the blood alcohol levels and the extrapolation admitted even though her blood was not drawn by law enforcement as they would normally do bedside in any DUI case, or I think they call it OUI in Massachusetts. The blood alcohol content that they're using to extrapolate was from a CBC blood panel that was taken by personnel at Good Samaritan Medical Center after Karen Reed was taken to the hospital because she was hysterical and sectioned were put on an involuntary hold. And there's going to be body cam footage from one of the responding officers on the scene, Sergeant Good of Canton PD, where you can hear him say, I'm going to section her. This was not the typical breathalyzer test or blood alcohol draw that they would do in the hospital when they were charging someone with a drunk driving charge or a drunk driving homicide in this case. John O'Keefe was a 16-year veteran of the Boston Police Department and Reed will be arraigned tomorrow. Homicide by negligent officer. Okay. Um, yes, her car had already been impounded by then. Her car was impounded the same day. Uh, on the, around the four o'clock hour, January 29th, 2022, at her parents' house in Dighton, which is about 40 miles drive. So she drove her car to Dighton to her parents' house, which is 40 miles in what they're calling a blizzard. Then they towed it back to the Sally Port at Canton PD who didn't even have jurisdiction over the case at that point. This case is so convoluted that I don't want to get off on tangents, but if you know, you know. Yeah, so Carr had already, was impounded on the 29th. So let's take a look and watch the original in, 
di uh, well, the original arraignment hearing, because I don't know how many of you have seen this. This is from January 2nd of 2022. This is the Stoughton District Court, and this is uh, WCVB5 in Boston. This was the live hearing. Operation of a motor vehicle, one con of leaving the scene of personal injury and death. These offenses taking place January 29, 2022 in the town of Canton. Good morning, ma'am. I'm advising you pursuant to Mass General Laws, Chapter 276, Section 58. Should you be charged with a crime or violate a release condition while this case is pending, you could be held in the House of Correction for up to 90 days without bail. Good morning, Mr. Nettie. Good, Good morning, morning, Mr. Lelly. Good morning, ma'am. All right. Um, Mr. Lelly. You know, with the court commission, could I just... The mass, yes, uh, yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Your Honor, Adam Lally for the Commonwealth. Uh, the Commonwealth is requesting uh, that the court set a cash bail in this matter in the amount of fifty thousand uh, dollars with uh, some additional conditions. Those conditions being the bail, okay. I had to check this because he talks so fast, Lally, that um, I wanted to make sure I wasn't on a high speed. This is normal speed. This is all the way back when masks were still required in courthouses and courtrooms. And um, you're going to hear, I'm going to stop because I'm, I want you to hear what Lally says. No warnings is just read uh, by Your Honor to the defendant, uh, as well as uh, conditions that she stay away and have no contact with the uh, deceased victim's family, uh, that she stay away and have no contact with the deceased victim's residence, and that she be uh, prohibited from operating a motor vehicle during the pendency uh, of this case. Um, in support of that request, Your Honor, the Commonwealth would cite uh, the nature and circumstances of the offense as well as the uh, potential penalty uh, that the defendant faces, uh, particularly with reference to the manslaughter charge and uh, the leaving the scene of personal injury and death, uh, the latter being a bind over. Um, the facts of this case, Your Honor, uh, uh, essentially on uh, Friday, uh, this past Friday into Saturday, January 29th, uh, at approximately 6.04 a.m., uh, the Canton Police Department received a 911 call uh, from a woman reporting a male party subsequently identified as a decedent uh, in victim, Mr. John O'Keefe, uh, who was found in the snow at a residence on Fairview Road. Uh, at the time of the 911 call, there was uh, heavy snow and the temperature was in the teens. Uh, officers Seraf and Mullaney uh, of the Cannon Police were dispatched to the scene along with Cannon Fire and EMS. Uh, Officer Seraf uh, was the first to arrive on scene and observed three females uh, waving at him. Uh, if you were standing on the roadway uh, looking at the property, uh, the three females were in the left corner of, of that property. Uh, Officer Seraf observed the victim uh, lying on the ground as two of the females were performing uh, CPR. Uh, the three females on scene were uh, subsequently identified as the defendant before you, Ms. Uh, Karen Reed, uh, Ms. Jennifer McCabe, and Ms. Kerry Roberts. Uh, Officer Seraf uh, observed the victim to be cold to the touch, uh, no signs of breath. Uh, and returned to his cruiser to retrieve uh, his AED device. Uh, at this time, Canton Fire and EMS arrived on scene and took over uh, first aid. Paramedics then transported uh, the victim to the Good Samaritan Hospital in Brockton, where he was uh, determined to be deceased several hours later. Uh, several uh, detectives from the Canton Police arrived on scene moments after the 911 call. Uh, they uh, began to search uh, within the uh, snowbanks uh, for any uh, evidence. Uh, at which point they discovered a broken cocktail uh, style glass. Okay, I'm going to stop right there. He says a broken cocktail style glass. We have been over the original Canton police reports. And in the Canton police reports, the evidence logged in was a broken drinking glass. The fact that he is changing the terminology during this arraignment makes you go, hmm. Why is he calling it a cocktail glass now when the Canton PD, who should be very well versed in evidence, not only evidence collection, but in evidence identification, are calling it a drinking glass? And my hypothesis is, and this is my opinion, that he is calling it a cocktail glass to make the drunk driving charges appear more real. Let me know what you think and multiple patches of uh, red substance that appeared to be uh, blood in the vicinity. Uh, they secured the glass and six blood samples uh, from that area as evidence. They secured the glass and the six blood samples. If you're new to this case, you, will, you don't know that they collected six drops of blood from the scene in red Solo cups that were gathered from a neighbor. And they also borrowed a, a leaf blower, a leaf blower from a neighbor to start blowing away 
the two inches of snow that had fallen thus far at 6 a.m. in Canton, Massachusetts on January 29th of 2022 to try and uncover some more evidence. What they did not find at the scene, which is 34 Fairview in Canton, home of police officer Brian Albert and his wife, Nicole, who is the sister of Jennifer McCabe, what they did not find during that initial search was any pieces of red tail light. The red tail light was not discovered until after 6 p.m., which was 12 hours later, approximately, after the car had been impounded and brought to the Canton Sally Port, and after the Massachusetts State Police took jurisdiction of this case and then started searching the scene again sometime around or after 6 p.m., and another 10 to 12 inches of snow had fallen. Uh, troopers from the uh, Norfolk County District Attorney's Office, uh, specifically Sergeant Buchanan. And troopers from the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office. Well, no, actually, they're troopers from the Massachusetts State Police who happen to report to the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office. But as I always say to you guys, not only is it what he's saying that's important, but it, it's what he's not saying. And why is he saying that they're troopers of the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office instead of saying that they're troopers of the Massachusetts State Police? Am I missing something? Am I in the Twilight Zone? Uh, they secured the glass and six blood samples uh, from that area as evidence. Uh, troopers from the uh, Norfolk County District Attorney's Office, uh, specifically Sergeant Buchanan and Trooper Proctor, uh, then uh, arrived at the scene, began to process. Uh, they also spoke to several witnesses. Um, specifically, they spoke to uh, Miss Jennifer McCabe. Um, she stated uh, that the evening prior- For those of you who don't know, Jennifer McCabe is the sister of the homeowner, Nicole Albert. Chief Sherry says, yes, state police are assigned to DA's offices as investigators. Yes, I agree. But aren't they uh, identified as being Massachusetts state police troopers? Because that's the way they've been referred to in every other pleading and every other report and every other hearing that we've listened to. And that's why I just thought that choice of words there was interesting. Prior, uh, they were, uh, she and some friends were at the waterfall uh, bar uh, located within the town of Canton. Uh, she stated she and her husband arrived there at approximately 9 p.m. At approximately 11 p.m., uh, the victim and the defendant arrived uh, at the waterfall bar together. Uh, that they she indicated to the troopers that uh, the victim and the defendant had been in a dating uh, relationship for the last two years and that the defendant uh, often stayed at the victim's house uh, most nights, is what she described it as. Uh, she observed the defendant walk into the bar holding a glass cup uh, from C.F. McCarthy's, uh, which is a bar located across the streets uh, from the waterfall uh, with a clear liquid inside and what she believed to be a... a uh, well, they say they have surveillance video. I'd like to see the surveillance video of her walking in with that cocktail glass. But um, it's logged. It's uh, being admitted at trial, so we will see that. Vodka soda drink. Uh, she observed the victim to be wearing a baseball hat, jeans, and sneakers. Uh, the victim and defendant uh, had been at C.F. McCarthy's uh, across the street before coming to the Waterfall Bar, as they stated. Uh, she stated that uh, the victim and defendant uh, appeared to be in a good mood, did not observe any arguing amongst the two, uh, described the atmosphere within the bar as friendly uh, amongst the patrons. Uh, she indicated as the bar began to close down, everyone was invited uh, back to that residence on Fairview Road. Uh, she observed uh, the defendant and the victim leave uh, the Waterfall Bar together. As the group was exiting, uh, the victim texted uh, Ms. McCabe, uh, where to, at 12.14 uh, a.m. Uh, she replied with the address on Fairview Road. Uh, at 12.18, four minutes later, uh, the victim called her to ask uh, where specifically uh, the house was located on Fairview Road. Uh, while inside the residence, uh, she observed a black SUV arrive in front of uh, the residence on Fairview Road. She observed this from the front door. Uh, she texted the victim at 12.31 a.m., hello. And at 12.40 a.m. texted, uh, pull up behind me. Uh, she then observed the black SUV move from the initial place the vehicle stopped on the street near the driveway and then proceeds uh, to the left side of the property. At 12.45 a.m., uh, she texted uh, the victim, hello, uh, again, and then observed the black SUV drive away. Uh, 
Uh, she stated that uh, they discovered the victim in the area where she last observed the SUV on the left side of the property uh, as facing from the street. And at approximately 4.53 a.m., she received a phone call from the defendant uh, looking for the victim. Uh, she indicated that the defendant was distraught and drove to her house. Uh, she indi the defendant indicated to Ms. McCabe that she last remembered seeing the victim at the Waterfall Bar. Uh, Ms. McCabe then informed the defendant that she observed the victim and her... Notice this is all hearsay. Ms. McCabe said, Ms. McCabe said, Ms. McCabe said, Ms. McCabe said... She doesn't, she last remember seeing him at the waterfall. But they're going to use it. Keep the bar together. Uh, Ms. McCabe then drove uh, the defendant's vehicle from her house back to the victim's uh, because the defendant was too hysterical to drive and had uh, the other friend, uh, Ms. Carrie Roberts, follow him. Uh, while driving to the victim's house, the defendant stated to Ms. McCabe, could I have hit him? Did I hit him? Again, the defendant stated to Ms. McCabe, this is everything that Jennifer McCabe is saying. Remember that Jennifer McCabe's sister owns the house on whose lawn Officer O'Keefe was found. And not one of the people in that house, and I think we're up to about 13 of them who were in the house that night. 11 of them left the house. Not one person saw his body on the lawn after they're alleging that Karen hit him with her car. The, Ms. McCabe stated that the defendant told her about a cracked taillight on her vehicle uh, once they arrived at the victim's home. And they said, again, Jennifer McCabe says that she told her about a cracked taillight on her vehicle. Uh, the defendant had uh, Ms. McCabe looked at, at that same uh, cracked taillight. Ms. McCabe described the passenger side right rear taillight as uh, cracked. Uh, they cracked. Ms. McCabe says it was cracked. At some point during this hearing, it's all of a sudden going to become shattered. Keep that in mind. They uh, then both entered Ms. Roberts' uh, vehicle to look for the victim, uh, with the defendant seated in the back as Ms. Roberts drove and Ms. McCabe was seated in the front passenger seat. Ms. McCabe stated that they turned on a Fairview Road from Chapman Street at the time. It was snowing heavily, creating poor visibility. Uh, Ms. McCabe stated that just prior to uh, the residence on Fairview Road, there was a cluster of trees, and immediately the defendant stated that she saw the victim. Uh, Ms. McCabe and Ms. Roberts were not able to see uh, the victim, and were initially confused uh, by the defendant's statement. Uh, Ms. McCabe stated that uh, the Ms. Roberts began wiping. They were initially confused by her statement. Okay. No, Jen, uh, Mark, it wasn't Jen's car. It wasn't um, Karen's car that they went back to the scene in. It was, I think it was Carrie Roberts' car. Carrie was driving, Jen was in the passenger seat, and Karen was in the right rear passenger seat looking out the left side window she saw the body there so he's saying that they say that they were confused that she saw the body because they didn't see the body snow off of the victim as uh, the defendant laid on top of him for warmth and then began cpr uh, the troopers then uh, proceeded to the good samaritan hospital to uh, view the victim uh, they observed approximately six bloodied uh, lacerations varying in length on his right arm there's a lot more than six. We've looked at those lacerations on his right arm. Uh, the cuts extending from his forearm to his bicep. Uh, both of the victim's eyes were swollen shut and black and blue. Uh, they observed a cut to the right eyelid area uh, of the victim. Uh, observed his clothing uh, to be blue jeans, an orange t-shirt, a long sleeve shirt, uh, and boxer shorts that were saturated uh, with blood and vomit. Uh, they observed... One Keep that in mind too. The boxer shorts are saturated with blood and vomit. One black Nike sneaker with a white Nike logo on the sides uh, belonging uh, to the victim. One sneaker. Seems they hadn't found the second sneaker yet. This is three days post-accident. On the 31st, uh, the troopers attended uh, the autopsy of Mr. O'Keefe at the... Uh okay, we have our answer. On the 31st, the troopers attended the autopsy. They attended the autopsy. That's why the autopsy report, in my opinion, by the way, this is my opinion. If you're going to clip this and put it on Twitter, this is my opinion. The troopers were present at the autopsy. That is why, in my opinion, Dr. Irene Scordy Bello, the medical examiner who wrote the autopsy report, put the sentence in that report that says something like, the injuries do not seem to be consistent with a fight. They were present. Proctor was in the room when the autopsy was done.
Office of the Chief Medical Examiner. Uh, the doctor uh, performed the autopsy, Dr. Scorty Below, uh, advised of uh, several abrasions, the right forearm, two swollen black eyes, a small cut above the right eye. Abrasions, abrasions, again, in my opinion, and really this is a medical term. So an abrasion is something like a scrape, road rash, or something that abrades the skin. What is on his arm and what you've seen in the autopsy photos are clear lacerations. They are cuts. They may be from a dog attack. They could be, they look like they could be from something like a knife. What they don't look like is something that would be caused by a bumper. They're not abrasions. They're not road rash type injuries. Didn't he say lacerations a little bit earlier and now he's going back to abrasions? A cut to the left side of his nose, approximately two inch laceration to the back of his head, uh, multiple skull, skull fractures that resulted in bleeding. Uh, and further advised that the victim's pancreas was a dark red color, uh, indicating that hypothermia was a contributing uh, factor uh, to his death. Uh, on January 29th, the troopers uh, conducted several other interviews, uh, including uh, Ms. Roberts. Uh, during the course of uh, Ms. Roberts' interview, uh, she indicated that she was initially contacted. And there are his parents and his, his brother, and that's just a heartbreaking shot. Like, they, they didn't need to do that. They're grieving. This is horrifying. Contacted by the defendant, uh, Ms. Reed, at 5 a.m. Uh, that she answered the phone to hear uh, the defendant state, John's dead. Terry, Terry, I wonder if he's dead. It's snowing. He got hit by a plow. Uh, the troopers also on the 29th uh, proceeded to the uh, the defendant's parents' home in Dighton, Massachusetts, uh, where they located uh, the uh, involved vehicle, which is a 2021 Black Lexus SUV. Uh, that vehicle was ultimately uh, seized and taken back to the Canton Police Department, where it was processed uh, by various factions of the state police. Um, their observations uh, of that uh, black SUV uh, indicated a, a crack in the right rear taillight. Uh, they did speak with the defendant. Their observations included a crack to the right rear taillight when they seized the car from Dighton. Did you hear that? A crack. When they seized it from Dighton the same day, January 29th of 2022, I'm going to take that back. This is what Lally is saying in open court on February 2nd of 2022 during Karen Reed's arraignment on the manslaughter charges in Stoughton District Court. I'll take it back. A little bit. This SUV, uh, that vehicle was ultimately uh, seized and taken back to the Canton Police Department, where it was processed uh, by various factions of the state police. Um, their observations uh, of that uh, black SUV uh, indicated a, a crack in the right rear taillight. A crack in the right rear taillight. Am I in the twilight zone? Tell me. They did speak with the defendant. Um, she indicated uh, that she had met with the victim uh, at the CF McCarthy's bar in Canton at approximately 9 p.m. on the 29th, uh, that he was there with several friends prior to her arrival. Uh, she stated the victim was consuming beer and she was drinking vodka sodas. Uh, she described the glassware she was drinking out of as a base style. Uh, she stated she and the victim uh, left CF McCarthy's and went to the waterfall, uh, that she did not... Uh, she indicated to the troopers that she did not leave C.F. McCarthy's or enter the waterfall bar with a glass or drink. Uh, she stated that she and the victim were at the waterfall for approximately one hour. Uh, during that time, there were no altercations and no injuries, no cuts or abrasions uh, that occurred uh, with the victim. Uh, she indicated that um, they left the waterfall and were invited to the house on Fairview Road. She stated that she dropped the victim at the house on Fairview and went home since she was having uh, stomach issues at the previous bar. Uh, she stated that she dropped the victim off. She made a three-point turn in the street and left, uh, did not see the victim enter the house. She indicated that she first observed the broken. DB says, are they alleging that all these injuries from the defendant backing up her vehicle? Yes. Yes. That is the allegation that all of these injuries occurred during a low-speed motor vehicle accident during which she backed into him with her Lexus SUV. He is approximately, I think he's six foot two. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that. And he had, a, he had a gash to the back of his head. He says two inches. I think it's more like three inches. That would have bled like a sieve. They estimated that he lost 
copious amounts of blood and yet they only found six blood drops at the scene and i i don't know if they ever even tested those blood drops did they test to see if they were someone else's blood did they just assume that they were officer o'keefe's blood i have questions tail light in the morning and did not know how she broke it uh the previous evening she said she noticed her tail light was broken in the morning and didn't realize how she how she broke it the previous evening she didn't say she broke it the previous evening uh, We've seen the video it. of her backing into John's car in the driveway when she pulls out at something like 5 something a.m. We've seen the ring video. Uh, she stated that she dropped the victim off. She made a three-point turn in the street and left, uh, did not see the victim enter the house. She indicated that she first observed the broken taillight in the morning and did not know how she broke it uh, the previous evening. Uh, she indicated that I think they've given up the three-point turn theory too, haven't they? Haven't they abandoned that theory? Uh, she discovered the victim in the morning. She observed him lying face up, snow on his legs, eyes swollen and blood coming from his nose and mouth, and that she uh, provided mouth-to-mouth uh, -mouth upon her arrival. Further indicated that throughout the night, she'd been calling and texting uh, the victim numerous times uh, with no response. <clears throat> Officers also interviewed uh, several first- he was still actively bleeding. Blood was still coming from his nose and mouth. If he had been, and listen, I'm not a doctor. I'm just a lawyer. But if he had been outside in the snow and froze to death since midnight for um, approximately five hours plus, would he still be actively bleeding? Drew says that blood was somewhere, not outside. Little cupcake says Jen said. Betty is ready. Interesting fact, the CW Commonwealth never acknowledges that Karen and John live together, but when they talk about Jen driving Karen home to drop off her car, they are referring to John's home, correct? Responders, including a uh, firefighter paramedic from the town of Canton, uh, indicated that uh, she arrived on scene, observed the victim's condition, uh, went to uh, speak to the defendant in regard to any uh, sort of prior medical issues or uh, causality of the uh, the injuries uh, that she observed to his face, uh, to which the defendant uh, then made several statements uh, to her, indicating, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him, I hit him. The uh, As I mentioned, the uh, black Lexus SUV uh, was seized. Uh, there were uh, fragments of broken glass that were observed on the rear bump of the vehicle, uh, the rear right passenger side. Fragments of broken glass that were found on the rear of the vehicle after it was towed back in a blizzard to Canton Sally Port, where that video goes missing of the car pull being pulled into the Canton Sally Port. I have questions. My uh, taillight was shattered, pieces missing shattered. in the red and clear areas. Okay, now it's shattered. Now the taillight's shattered, but the right when they observed the it, tailgate. sorry, when they observed it in Dighton, it was a crack, but now. Once it gets back to the Canton Sally port, it's shattered. Are you following this, my friends? Are you following this? Is anybody following this with me? If you're just joining, this is the February 2nd, 2022 arraignment of Karen Reed on manslaughter charges, which were then upgraded in June to murder. And this is what Assistant District Attorney Adam Lally is telling the judge on the date of her arraignment. The uh, black Lexus SUV uh, was seized. Uh, there were uh, fragments of broken glass that were observed on the rear bump. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, black Lexus SUV uh, was seized. Uh, there were uh, fragments of broken glass that were observed on the rear bump of the vehicle. When? When were they observed? Not until it got back to Canton, because they just said they observed it in Dighton and there was a crack tail light. Okay. I think the tow truck driver who towed that car is going to testify. He's on the witness list for the defense. That'll be interesting. Anybody who's ever had their car towed by anybody, when you call AAA and they come and tow your car, they take photos of your car because they don't want to be held responsible for any damage that didn't exist after they tow your car. Especially if they're towing you from the scene of an accident. They need to, they need to photograph the damage. Uh, the rear right passenger side tail light was shattered pieces missing uh, from the red and clear air now it's shattered and pieces are missing suddenly poof it's like magic areas 
On the right side of the rear tailgate, a deep scratch and minor dent was observed. On the right side of the rear bumper above a uh, small red light, uh, two scratches were observed in one area where uh, paint was chipped off. Uh, troopers from the occlusion analysis and reconstruction section of the state police performed uh, several tests on the vehicle, including a uh, rapid acceleration forward and reverse, uh, noting that there was no deficiencies with the braking system. Uh, they also uh, implemented uh, the use of a, a training figure resembling a human approximately six feet in height that was placed behind uh, this Lexus. Uh, it was operated by members of the CARS unit and documented uh, with a video. Uh, the vehicle was placed in reverse and started to uh, travel towards uh, said training figure. Uh, the rear view camera uh, on the vehicle was operating uh, properly, uh, providing a 180 degree uh, visual. Well, there you go. The rear view camera was operating properly. Doesn't that go to the fact that she didn't hit him? I mean, they're, they're, t they're talking about what they observed during testing, the, their physical testing of the vehicle, but where's the black box data or the uh, telematics data or the data from whether or not that car hit anything that night? Because my understanding is that that data shows that the car did not hit anything that night. Tell me if I'm wrong. Well, and as Alexis traveled closer uh, to the figure, both auditory and visual cues uh, began to sound off uh, within the vehicle, indicating an obstruction to the rear. Um, in addition, uh, on the 29th, uh, the Massachusetts Special Emergency Response Team, or CERT, uh, was activated uh, to assist in searching for potential evidence outside of the residence. Uh, the Standing on the street, looking to the left of the property, there was a fire hydrant uh, located there. Uh, in that area, they located a black uh, Nike sneaker uh, with a white Nike. Okay, so they located the sneaker by the fire hydrant. And remember, the CERT team didn't show up until 6 p.m., so it's 12, almost, almost 12 hours later. And um, it has snowed another 10 to 12 inches. That's all easily provable by verified weather records. So MSP, Trooper Proctor, who happens to have close ties to the family that happens to own the home, is now the lead on this, even though he wasn't working that day. And all of a sudden, 12 hours later, they find the other sneaker right next to the fire hydrant on top of the snow, I assume, right? Because now 10 to 12 more inches of snow has fallen. And now they're going to find the taillight pieces. So what they want you to believe, my friends, is that the Canton PD is so incompetent. They are so incompetent that despite the fact that they found clear pieces of drinking glass and six drops of blood, they did not see a black sneaker or red taillight pieces. That's what they want you to believe. Oh, and by the way, in case you don't know, um, Brian Albert, who owns the home, who's a Boston police officer, his brother, Kevin Albert, at the time was a Canton police officer. And across the street from where Brian Albert lived was the deputy chief of the Canton Police Department, who says that his ring camera uh, didn't pick up anything that night of interest. So... They never looked around for any other ring footage from anywhere. But yet they told the media that they had ring footage. So, hmm. The logo on the side matching that uh, found on the victim's body uh, in the area of the streets uh, where the victim was uh, recovered. In addition, uh, in that same area, they located two red uh, plastic pieces uh, of a taillight uh, consistent uh, with the missing pieces from Miss Reed's black Lexus SUV, as well as one uh, piece of clear plastic piece of a taillight uh, located in the same area, also consistent with the broken taillight on the Lexus SUV. Uh, Your Honor, with the nature and circumstances of those facts, as well as the potential penalty that the defendant faces uh, on uh, these charges, the Commonwealth is requesting that the court set a $50,000 cash bail with the conditions uh, as outlined previously. So they ask for a $50,000 cash bail. Thank you, Mr. Lally. Thank you. Mr. Yannetti. Okay, before we hear from Mr. Yannetti, who, remember, was probably hired maybe two days before this, things that make you go, hmm, says Kimmy. I'm going to take a moment to go to the chat and also to thank Maureen Francis, as always, for getting in there with the cash app and for Nancy for sending a Venmo who says, thanks for covering this case. I appreciate you guys so much. And you're, as always, very, very, very appreciated. Um, and Amber, who I did not thank last stream. Thank you so much.
Dave the Pious. Hi, how are you? Thanks for your super chat. There are so many red flags here. It feels like a parade. Oh, I used to say that too with regard to relationships. When some people say re see red flags, I see a parade. But yeah, I, I totally agree with you. Uh, Tara, thanks for becoming a member. Leo Bunker, thanks for your super chat. Would Jackson's firm represent Karen in her civil rights suit against MSP, CPD, et cetera, since they have intimate knowledge of her case? I don't know that he handles civil cases. He may only handle criminal cases, so I do not know the answer to that. Um, you know, most lawyers specialize in a certain area of law. I used to say to my clients who would ask me to do other things for them is, you know, they'd say, can you draft my will? Can you, I'm like, no, I can't. like, would you go to a veterinarian to give your child stitches? You, usually you, you specialize in one kind of law and you would want to go to somebody who specializes in specifically those kind of cases. But a great question. Jackie became a member. Yay. That KK became a member. Yay. Amy, thanks for gifting memberships. And Daisy became a member. Congratulations on manifesting. And thank you so, 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 so much for becoming members. You guys, I think you're going to like it here. Seagirl says, I keep hear hearing people say, wait to see what evidence comes in from prosecution. Can you explain why something not submitting during discovery is allowed to come in during trial? We love Melanie. It's a great, great question. And it's going to be within the judge's discretion. And as we know, because we've been covering this case for a long time, and we've gone back and looked at the hearings that happened before I started covering this, this uh, case in January, it's at the judge's discretion. So you know they've been fighting to get the Bodhi DNA results the defense has for many, many, many months, if not a year or more. And that is just being submitted now. So uh, the judge has a lot of discretion with regard to what evidence comes in. And uh, she hasn't ruled on some of this stuff yet. So I think we're going to find out. DDKK question. If Karen was sectioned on the 29th, how did her car get to her parents' house? Great question. Apparently they brought her in to section her, but they let her out. And I believe she did drive her car to Dighton. If anybody has uh, differing information, please let me know. This is a collaborative channel. And I know so many of you know the players involved here. You know uh, more than I do on this case. And uh, please let me know. But my understanding is she was let go. They did not feel the need to keep her on a 72-hour hold. I think they call it a section 12 in Massachusetts. And they took her there. They took her blood and then they let her go. Hi, Heather. I'm behind, but what type of testing did they claim to do? I never heard them mention GCMS. I'll look for that stuff as a former kind of, uh, you know what they did? They took her ethanol level from the uh, CBC. I'm assuming it was a CBC that they did. They took her ethanol level and they're trying to extrapolate that back. They took it sometime after 9 a.m. and they're trying to extrapolate that back. And according to their calculations, and if you're a chemist, you're going to be interested in this. According to their calculations, according to that ethanol level, and I don't remember what the ethanol level was, but they were they were claiming that when they did draw her blood, she her blood alcohol level was 0.08. And when they extrapolated it back to something like 12.45 a.m., they're saying it was between 0.13 and 0.29. I think that's um, a little bit of a range there. 0.13 and 0.29. I find that to be a incredibly large swing. And if you're a chemist, please chime back in and let me know whether I'm in the twilight zone about that. Oh, I think this is a good time to uh, hear a word from our sponsor. For those of you who don't know, AT&T Wireless had a massive data breach a couple of months ago when they told everyone that their service was out for the day and they were doing a uh, software update and they gave everyone a $5 credit on their bill and you may have been affected by that. But what really had happened is that 74 million customers of AT&T Wireless, your social security numbers were leaked to the dark web. Not just your socials, but your name, address, date of birth. And not just current customers, but customers who had been customers since before 2019. And my sponsor has been my sponsor before that story broke, but I think it's timely. So take a listen to our, a message from our sponsor, Aura. Did you know that the odds of falling victim to online crime are one in four? Online crime is soaring. 
it's time to get smart about online safety. That's why I've been using Aura, the sponsor of today's video. Aura provides everything you need to protect your privacy, identity, finances, and your family in one easy to use app. Do you even realize how much of your personal information is already out there being sold by data brokers to scammers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to target you? Well, if you Google yourself, you may find something like this. And it may shock you to know that your full name, home address, email address, health records, and even relatives, it's all out there. That's one of the reasons you need Aura. Aura shows you which data brokers are selling your information and automatically submits opt-out requests on your behalf. Not only does cleaning up this information reduce the amount of spam that you get, but it will protect you from hackers who could use the information to help them access your social media accounts, bank accounts, and other sensitive information. Aura also helps protect me and my family from online threats by providing antivirus and malware protection, a secure VPN with military-grade encryption, credit monitoring, spam call protection, parental controls, password management, identity theft insurance, and more without having to download several different apps. It's really easy to set up. And best of all, I get everything at one affordable price. With the family plan, Aura will help you protect your kids by blocking harmful content, managing how much time they can spend online, and providing you with peace of mind while they game with cyberbullying and online predator threat alerts. I value my privacy and my online safety, and I value yours too. So go to Aura.com slash Melanie Little to start your two-week free trial because you can't put a price on peace of mind. I've also put the link in the video description below. You can thank me later. You know, it's interesting too because I was talking to a girlfriend. I was out with a girlfriend last night, and she was telling me a story of someone that she, know who's, uh, she knows who is in their 80s who um, just had the title to their home stolen. Somebody stole this person's identity. Um, and apparently it's easier to steal the title to someone's home if you do not have a mortgage on your house. So for those of you who have parents whose um, homes may be totally paid off with no mortgage or no lien on them, they are very vulnerable to having the title to their home stolen. It's really a nightmare to try and get it back. So I'm just saying, for starting at 12 bucks a month, or is an important thing. I do use it, and so many of my viewers use it as well. And uh, can't put a price on your online safety, folks. All right, let's get back to uh, this hearing, and now we are going to hear Mr. Yonetti speak for the first time in court in this case. And this goes back to February 2nd of 2022. This was in Stoughton District Court during Karen Reed's arraignment. And if you would, go right to the mic. Thank you, Ron. Good morning again, Your Honor. David Unetti for Karen Reed. Judge, my client is 41 years old with no criminal record. My client grew up in Taunton, Massachusetts. She's a graduate of Coyle Cassidy High School in 1998. And when it came time to go to college, she stayed in Massachusetts and went to Bentley College. She graduated with a uh, Bachelor of Science in um, Finance in 2003. And uh, since then has worked in the financial sector. And in fact, she's been at a very large uh, well-known financial company since 2007, where she's currently an equity analyst. In addition, she's an adjunct professor at a, a Massachusetts uh, university as well, and she's been there since 2008. Uh, in addition, Judge, um, my client suffers from a host of medical issues. Um, from the time that she was 25, she's had multiple serious illnesses diagnosed beginning in 2005 with colitis, which ultimately led to her colon being completely removed in 2009. She's been in pain for a number of years. Um, and a Did everyone know that? He's going to go into detail about more of her medical conditions. And so when uh, Marietta Sullivan or whichever Sullivan it was that was testifying in front of the grand jury, about Aruba, thought that Karen was an a-hole because she wanted to have her own bathroom in Aruba and that, you know, she uh, 
rubbed her the wrong way, as if this is any sort of evidence related to motive for murder, um, gives you a little bit more understanding why a woman on a vacation might want her own bathroom when they removed most of her colon. Eventually also was diagnosed with MS uh, as well in 2013, um, continued to have, uh, you know, digestion uh, issues and uh, bowel issues. Uh, and this past summer, uh, my client unfortunately was diagnosed with having a brain tumor as a result of uh, migraines that she had never had before. Uh, there is still no answer regarding whether that brain tumor is cancerous or not. And I bring this up not for uh, the purpose of uh, evoking any sympathy, but to um, focus on what the court's inquiry is here today. The, the inquiry is, what is the likelihood that my client will appear in court for her trial? Uh, does bail need to be set to assure her appearance at trial? And, and if so, how much bail should be set? Her roots are here. She was born here, she went to school here, she went to college here, and her doctors are here. And in addition, her family is here. Her parents are present in the courtroom, her brother and, and her sister-in-law are present in the courtroom. Um, and Your Honor, just so the court's aware, um, I'd like to uh, uh, have uh, my, a letter that I sent to the Norfolk County District Attorney's Office this weekend. Um, it was faxed on Saturday. Uh, where um, I uh, promised uh, that my client would appear uh, if they just called me. All they had to do was notify me, and I, I wrote right in the letter that she would uh, report to any police barracks or police station or courthouse to which they directed uh, me. Um, they ignored that and instead got an arrest warrant uh, for my client. Yeah, and that's that's also pretty gross, too. They know that she's represented. All they had to do was call him and she would have surrendered her just like what happened to Chris Albert all the way back in the 90s when he was involved in a fatal, fatal motor vehicle accident and he killed a 26-year-old student. He surrendered with his attorney 30 hours after that accident. And he was represented in that case by Judge Canoni's brother, who is a lawyer, okay? The family ties or the, the roots of the family tree in Canton are twisted, my friends. Twisted. But they didn't call him and say, could you come in with your client, bring her down to the precinct and surrender her? No, 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 no. They wanted to scare her. So they went and they picked her up. Brought her down there and didn't do him the courtesy of giving him a call. However, um, she knew she had hired an attorney since January 30th, this Saturday, because the police had come and they had taken her phone and they had taken her car. She knew that they were considering her a suspect, rightly or wrongly. Uh, and what did she do? They arrested her at the very address that I included in my uh, letter to, to the Commonwealth, with the, which the Commonwealth ignored. This is relevant, I would assert, Judge, regarding whether she is a flight risk. I think that that is it doesn't really pass the straight face test. She is not going anywhere. She didn't go anywhere. I don't, frankly, don't think they've overcome the presumption um, of, of personal recognizance in this case. With regard to the, the facts of the case, Judge, um, I've read the affidavit that the prosecution has now read. Um, manslaughter is a tremendous reach in this case. Um, I don't see any in criminal intent that would justify manslaughter in that affidavit. And there's a reason for that, because there was no criminal intent. This was not some random stranger. This was my client's boyfriend, somebody with whom she was in love, somebody with whom she essentially lived uh, with. And, and uh, by the way, the, the police have her phone. Uh, at 4.30 in the morning, my client is placing multiple calls to the, to the victim in this case, to her boyfriend. Uh, wondering where he is, why he hasn't come home, and getting annoyed with him because his niece, uh, of whom he was a guardian, had to go to bed without saying goodnight to him. She had no idea that he was deceased or that anything had happened. Um, at 5.30 in the morning, she's placing probably about 10 calls to him for the same reason, 
before she now knows something has to be wrong because he never stayed out at night without her. If they were ever out at night, they were always together. He had never not come home. Um, and that's when she calls her uh, girlfriend and goes back to the scene and sees this horrific uh, scene. So, yeah. So he's giving us an excellent explanation that a lot of people have questioned. Oh, Sherry, I see you used the new uh, Twilight Zone um, uh, emoji. Do you like that? I was playing around with emojis that came out. Somebody hit the Alice in Wonderland one for me because I don't know if it shows up. Let me know if it shows up because I'm watching it on my phone. It won't show up on StreamYard for me. I put in an Alice in Wonderland emoji for the members and a Twilight Zone emoji and one that says we are outraged. Oh, the Alice, do Alice does work. Yay. Oh, I love it. Can you try the we are outraged one? It's black and it has like a some white lettering on it with a red microphone in the middle where it's like circled. And yeah, you can't really read it. I have to make that one bigger. Thanks, KPT. Yeah, you can't really read that one. But it says we are outraged with a microphone with a line through it. Awesome. Oh, good. I'm glad you like God's like, and I'm going to play around and make some more emojis when I have time. So he's explaining now, there are so many of the Twittyets who are saying, why would she be so, you know, uh, freaked out that he didn't come home? Like he was just drunk. He probably crashed on someone's couch. Why would she wake up freaking out thinking that, uh, you know, he was dead? He's giving us a little insight into why he had never not come home before. He would never leave his niece home alone. Kirk says they put her in jail twice until she was arraigned just to scare her into pleading. Yep. That's your opinion. We're all entitled to them, but I happen to think you may be onto something there. Anne says, Melanie, what do you think will happen Monday? They still have to pick alternate jurors, don't they? If that's done, would they start the trial Monday? Well, they still have to come up with four alternates. That could take all day. I don't think they're going to open Monday. And my guess is that if they do get four alternates on Monday, they will start Tuesday. The trial schedule is Monday, Wednesday, Friday, full days, Tuesday, Thursday, Tuesday, Thursday afternoons. So if that takes the full day Monday, they will open in the afternoon on Tuesday. And I'm here for it with you. Let's continue. Your Honor, uh, this is a, a, a defensible case. There is no reason for her to run. She's done the opposite. She hired an attorney almost right away. And by the way, there will be substantial issues regarding a motion to suppress statements here. As I put in the letter, and I'd, I'd like to, again, have this marked as an exhibit for the bail hearing. Um, as I put in the letter, the, the police multiple times violated Mr. her. Uh, Mr. Lally, uh, any objection to the letter? Coming? No objection. All right, thank you. We'll accept it. We'll mark. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, the police violated her, her right to counsel multiple times, Your Honor, and we'll, we'll be able to show that at a motion to suppress hearing. Their, their case essentially can, comes down to statements because... There's no eyewitnesses. It doesn't appear as though there's any video evidence. There's, But they said there was video evidence on the news. They told the public right away that they had ring video footage of Karen hitting John with her car. So everyone who saw that was like, oh, okay, case closed. But now during the arraignment, it comes out that there isn't any, but they didn't correct it in the media. Notice that? I didn't say that. Nothing to indicate what actually happened uh, the, uh, on the day in question. And uh, I think the the, the police uh, sort of uh, acting out of desperation, realizing that they didn't really have much of a case, needed some type of confession for her from her. She did not give it to them. And yet they questioned her despite the fact that she asked for a lawyer. So the, the bottom line, Judge, is it's a defensible case. She's not a flight risk. And um, recognizing the, the, uh, the seriousness of the charges, I won't ask for personal recognizance, but I, I would assert to the court, this case does not justify more than a $5,000 cash bill. Thank you. Uh, my, my guess is you have no objection to the proposed conditions. Um, well, the, the only condition that I would uh, ask to be heard on, Your Honor, is this condition that she not drive. The, the police uh, and the district attorney's office and the registry of motor vehicles have uh, options to address that issue if they believe that she's an unsafe driver. And I would ask the court not to get involved with that issue. I thought he said they have, they have auctions, but he said they have options. <laughs> in his Boston accent, it sounds like auctions. So in my, to my ears, to your, you probably didn't hear it, but I heard it. Uh, so he's saying option, they have options. 
to deal with her not driving, et cetera. Thank you. All right, with regard to the conditions, um, uh, she is ordered not to drive unless licensed or permitted by the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles. Uh, and um, I appreciate your argument, Mr. Yannetti, but uh, due to the nature and the circumstances of the offenses charged, specifically one and three, and the potential penalty, uh, I know what your letter says, you're the lawyer, but uh, she has plenty of reason to flee given the potential penalty, I'm opposing the $50,000 cash. Yes, on the motion, uh, I have a, uh, Mr. Lally, a, a motion for preservation of evidence. Have you had a chance to review it? I have, yes, ma'am. Do you have any objection to it? I do not, ma'am. All right, thank you. I'll allow that. Okay, that's the motion for preservation of evidence. I'm going to take that back so you can hear that. Reason to flee given the potential penalty, I'm opposing the $50,000 cash. Yes, on the motion, uh, I have a, uh, Mr. Lally, a, a motion for preservation of evidence. Have you had a chance to review it? I have, yes, ma'am. Do you have any objection to it? I do not, ma'am. All right, thank you. I'll allow that. Can I have a date, please? That is the motion to preserve evidence. All evidence needed to be preserved in this case, including cell phones of witnesses, and uh, they violated that order to preserve evidence when they allowed Brian Albert and Brian Higgins to destroy their phones. In fact, I think that defense went so far as to say that they were given permission to destroy their phones. And that was discovered during the federal investigation of this investigation, which is still ongoing. And uh, just to be clear for the record, with regard to that motion being allowed, Judge, I would ask that it be effective with the court's signature with regard to previous uh, reports that have been filed and anything that's been gathered, and certainly going forward. There should be no destruction of notes going forward in this investigation. Well, it speaks for itself. Yes. It's a preservation of evidence. I just signed it. It's tw uh, 10 22 a.m. on February 2nd. That's when it's effective. Thank you very much. Okay. Note that both those phones were destroyed after that date. And this was a different judge, and his name is escaping me right now, but I know that he was referred to in some recent motion papers. If anybody knows this judge's name out of Stoughton District Court, he's the one who signed that preservation order. So it's a problem. No destruction of notes. Yep. We're going to see. None of these witness statements were recorded, signed, initialed by any of the witnesses. They were not interviewed with body cam footage or with in the precinct, in an interrogation room with any sort of video or even a dictaphone. Trooper Proctor says he doesn't have any notes about these witness statements, but some of them were not typed up until months later. Lally hasn't given him notes. Nope. That's true. It is two different two different judges in district court. No, well, the Judge Canoni, who is the female judge who's on the case now, is in Norfolk Superior Court. This was a judge in Stoughton District before the charges were upgraded to murder. Mark Stone says the destruction of the two phones is blatant evidence of guilt or consciousness of guilt, I might submit to you. Um, in terms of the next day, can I have March 1st, Judge? Sure. Mr. Lally, that work for you? Um... If not, we'll, if not, we'll go to another day. If possible, uh, yeah. Um, if possible, uh, the third or the fourth, if that's... Maybe Judge Krupp, oh, you may be right. She is entitled Came to be brought back within 30 days. Sure. Uh, um, but, I mean, but I uh, Mr. Lally, if I may, Mr. Lally, you can have a 9 o'clock, 11 o'clock, or 2 o'clock oh, call. Um, thank you. Um, 11 o'clock on the first is fine. All right. That worked, Ms. Thank you. You have a right to petition the Superior Court for a review of that bail. Conditions on this case are that you stay away and have no contact with the victim's family, stay away from the victim's residence, and do not drive a motor vehicle unless permitted to by the Registry of Motor Vehicles. You'll need to have signed those conditions before you're transported today. So, uh, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Okay. Okay. So um, there's that which many of you may not have seen before uh, and may be upset to watch. But 
Lally clearly said the taillight was cracked when they went to tow it in Dighton. And then later on, it was shattered. So if it was cracked in Dighton and then towed 40 miles back to Canton, did it shatter during the tow? That's what I want to know. Uh, I think there's a lot of reasonable doubt here. Uh, I have questions as who said it was okay to destroy the phones. It was police, not a judge, right? I think it was, uh, it was definitely not a judge. The preservation order was still in effect. It was what well, the defense is claiming the district attorney's office gave Higgins and, and Brian Albert permission to destroy their phones. That's the allegation. So it's a bit crazy. Uh, okay. Let's go to the motions and the recent court filings. And then we're going to go back and uh, look at that Banfield. Uh, piece that I have for you to watch. And I also reached out to the guest who was on Banfield that night. And he, while we were on the stream, he just responded to me and gave me his contact information. So I'm hoping that we can get him to join us one day to help me feel <laughs> uh, once more that I am not as such in the twilight zone with the, my thinking on this case. Because as you know, I have been confronted by people on core tv who used to work for the fbi one one in particular who told me that i was insane for thinking that the injuries to officer o'keefe's right arm were caused by anything other than a car <laughs> despite the fact that during my 30-year career i handled hundreds if not thousands of motor vehicle accidents and many 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 hundreds of dog bite cases as well and had a dog bite expert on my channel one day to talk about why the injuries clearly appear to be dog bites. And then the family pet, the German Shepherd that the Alberts owned, was rehomed during the pendency of the state grand jury, allegedly, and therefore could not be tested. DNA could not be tested. And, and then the basement flooring of the Albert home was ripped up. And when I brought that up on court TV, the FBI, former FBI firearms trainer said, well, that's because they had a flood in their basement. And I said, well, the house was also sold. And she said, well, that, was, that house was sold months later. So I don't know. She said, because I didn't have a PhD, I could definitely not opine on what those injuries to Officer O'Keefe's arm were. But coincidentally, the FBI, who is investigating the investigation of this case, did hire three PhDs to perform an accident reconstruction analysis on this case. And they unequivocally said, Officer John O'Keefe was not hit by a car and a car did not hit Officer John O'Keefe. So there's that. Okay, okay. Let us take a look now at uh, Lally's. motion regarding the blood alcohol content and the blood draw. Deanna asks if there was a way, way to see if there was an insurance claim. That's very interesting. Uh, this person who was on court TV seemed to say that. I don't know. But I also want to know where is the motor vehicle accident report for this motor vehicle accident? Because in New York, in any case, that causes something like over a thousand dollars in property damage and or personal injury and or death you are required or the police are required to file a motor vehicle accident report which is known as an mv104 in albany so if there's no motor vehicle accident report from this case and the death certificate says undetermined where's the proof that this was in fact a motor vehicle accident I'm just not seeing it. I'm just not. But yeah, that's a great question, uh, Deanna, about you're talking about the ripping up of the flooring. Agreed. Okay, so this was just filed April 18th, which was two days ago, Thursday, by the Commonwealth. Because remember when they orally argued this motion in Lemonade, because defense made a motion in Lemonade, or we're calling it motions in Lemonade now, because that's what the closed captions said on that hearing. Defense made a motion to keep out the, um, thank you, Dudley Do-Right, for that email that you just sent me. I'm going to take a look at it. Um, but now I lost my train of thought. 
the defense made a motion in lemon uh, lemonade <laughs> to exclude the blood alcohol results as not being reliable and not being drawn properly. Uh, and Lally got up and argued or only put in something like a two sentence or two paragraph report on that or response on that. And she said, uh, Mr. Lally, I want you to brief this for me. So uh, here's his response to that. This is the Commonwealth's motion in limine to admit results of defendant's blood draw at Good Samaritan Hospital and resulting serum conversion and retrograde extrapolation. And it is only two pages, so we will read through this right now. Now comes the Commonwealth and respectively moves this honorable court in limine to admit evidence about the defendant's blood draw at Good Samaritan Hospital during the course of her medical treatment and results from a blood alcohol serum conversion and retrograde extrapolation to establish the percentage of alcohol in the defendant's blood. The defendant's medical record of the blood test is admissible under GL section 233 section 79 pursuant to GL 233 section 79 Records kept by hospitals shall be admissible and may be admitted by the court in its discretion as evidence in the courts of the Commonwealth, so far as such records relate to the treatment and medical history of such cases, and the court may, in its discretion, admit copies of such records, if certified by the persons in custody thereof, to be true and complete. Citing another case, medical records generated for evaluation and treatment purposes do not constitute testimonial evidence. The Commonwealth anticipates that the medical providers who participated in the blood draw will testify to their knowledge, training, and expertise in how the test was administered to demonstrate their reliable basis in the knowledge and experience in the discipline. Okay, so that's two parts. First of all, hospital records are usually admitted into evidence as long as someone from the hospital comes in as the record keeper and, and lays a foundation and says that these are the medical records of the hospital. I certified them. They are a true and complete copy of the medical records pertaining to this patient on this date. And medical records often come into evidence. But now that what they want to do is they want to call in the providers who actually did the blood draw to testify about how the blood draw was performed. And I think we saw some of those names on the, their wit witness list when we went over this the other night. Back to the document. The defendant claims they should not have to guess on how the hospital conducted its testing. However, the defendant did not move to suppress this evidence, has not requested an evidentiary hearing, and has not requested a Dalbert Lanigan hearing challenging the reliability or the validity of the underlying scientific theory, process, or general acceptance in the relevant scientific community. Further, the defendant's challenge goes to the weight of the evidence, not its admissibility. So they're trying to get the, the blood results in based on the fact that they're willing to bring in the providers to show how they drew the blood. And he's saying that it should be admissible because this should go to the weight of the evidence. But I, I, don't, I don't think that the defendants, I think the defendant challenged its admissibility. Uh, I disagree. The defendant does not independently challenge the admissibility of the blood alcohol serum conversion and retrograde application, only that the initial blood test result was unreliable. Uh, see General Law Section uh, 90, Section 24, 1E. A certificate signed and sworn to by a chemist of the Department of the State Police or by a chemist of a laboratory certified by the Department of Public Health, which contains the result of an analysis made by such chemist of the percentage of alcohol in such blood shall be prima facie evidence of the percentage of alcohol in such blood. They're citing a case that they say stands for retrograde extra extrapolation is admissible evidence and satisfies Daubert Lanigan standard. The Daubert Lanigan standard is uh, a standard by which experts are questioned. They do a voir dire of experts oftentimes before they testify to see if the court is willing to qualify them as an expert and they have to testify as to their experience, knowledge, training, education, any articles that they've written on the subject in order to have the judge qualify the witness as an expert. And oftentimes, judge says no. <laughs> not, I can't qualify this person as an expert. 
Should the court have any reservations about the qualifications of the witnesses from Good Samaritan Hospital, the court has discretion to conduct the voir dire of each witness prior to their testimony. So that is the opposition of the Commonwealth. Let me just take a look at something here. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dudley Do Right, for coming in with the receipts. All right, you guys, we're gonna we're gonna flip over to this document right now because this is um the original preservation order that we just heard about in the hearing, in the arraignment hearing. Uh, and we're I'm gonna show you that original preservation order, which is uh dated February 2nd. 2022 and signed off on by the judge as you recall he just said that the judge just said that he signed it on that day so let's just take a look at this real quick so you can see what was ordered by the judge in stoughton on that day thank you dudley do right got all the documents just just waiting to go I love that. I love how collaborative you guys are. It really makes me very, very happy that you're willing to help me in my times of need without an assistant. So here is that original preservation order. And this was from the district court in Stoughton because that's where this case was at the time because at the time it was just a misdemeanor. And this is what Mr. Yannetti asked for, and this is what the judge gave him. It was allowed. You can see right here in the upper right, this is my cursor. It is not a fly on your screen. It was allowed by the judge and signed with no objection from Mr. Lally. And here is what um, Yannetti asked the judge to order be preserved by the Commonwealth. One, all notes of any law enforcement official, police officer, and or state trooper of any and all witness interviews, including any notes of anything the defendant is alleged to have said. The defendant is specifically requesting this court to order that such notes are not to be destroyed upon completion of police reports. Two, any notes, all notes, any law enforcement official, police officer, and or state trooper regarding this investigation. The defendant is specifically requesting this court to order that such notes are not to be destroyed upon the completion of police reports. Three, all turret tapes from any local police department and the Massachusetts State Police regarding this matter from the first time the police were contacted to the arrest of the defendant. Four, all 911 recordings regarding this matter. Five, all trace evidence, including but not limited to fingerprints, DNA evidence, blood, saliva, and any other bodily fluids. The defendant is specifically moving this court to order that no exhaustive testing should be performed on any evidence in connection with this case without the Commonwealth giving prior notice to the defendant and allowing the defendant to object. Five, I mean six. All physical evidence, including anything present on or near the decedent at the time his body was discovered, anything found at the alleged crime scene. As grounds, therefore, defendant states that said notes may contain exculpatory evidence to which the defendant would be entitled. The defendant also states that without an order of preservation at this early juncture, the Commonwealth would be held to a lesser standard of preservation prejudicing the defendant. Wherefore, defendant re uh, requests that this honorable court allow this emergency motion for preservation of evidence that was signed and ordered February 2nd of 2022. And all mo motions have to be accompanied by an affidavit of someone with knowledge. And this isn't the affidavit of David Yannetti, who is affirming that he is the one asking for this. And that was so ordered by this judge. I think we... we is Judge Krupp, yeah. They have specifically told the defense that there are no notes. There are no notes, no notes. We, we didn't take any notes, we don't have any notes. There's just no notes. 
So um, I don't know what you say or what say you about that, but uh, doesn't make me happy. Nobody asked me to the chat. Thank you so much, Dudley Do Right, for sending that over. Because that is fantastic. Lou Lamarocco, thank you so much for your super chat. I'm following that Karen Reed has changed her story several times, not to mention the defense dropping the canine bites and attorney Jackson is taking Ms. Reed on let's pull all the stops like Ann Taylor in the Moscow case. Well, uh, I don't know where you're hearing that she's changed her story several times because they only have one statement from her in Dighton and then and then they have some body cam footage from her second arrest in June that they played in court the other day during which uh, Lally was tell Lally, the ADA, told the court that in this video, you are going to see that Karen Reed in the precinct or wherever they brought her, the barracks, I'm not sure what they call the, the state police in Massachusetts, but in the body cam footage, you are going to see and you are going to hear Karen Reed say that she saw Brian Albert and Colin Albert smash John O'Keefe's head into the taillight of her vehicle. And the judge said, okay, let's see the video. And she did not say that. She the, absolutely did not say that. She said, we're all in on the same joke here. You know that Brian Albert and Colin Albert beat John up, right? And then she said, my taillight was cracked and John was pulverized. That's what she said. So, you know, there's not... I don't know where you're, I mean, if you can point me to some stories that she's changing, you can let me know. Defense dropping the canine bites. I don't know where that is either. I know that they're going to be, the Commonwealth is going to put on a canine DNA expert who I assume is going to say that she tested the clo John O'Keefe's clothing and did not find any canine DNA on his clothing. But I think that she's going to be cross-examined and I, I submit to you that the chain of custody alone for that clothing is going to preclude the reliability of any of the testing that was done. Because if you don't know, uh, officer John O'Keefe's clothing was thrown on the floor while he was laying on a gurney in the hospital. There's photos of it. And then after Proctor collected the clothing, he, um, held on to them for some period of time, at least like something like four to six weeks before logging them into evidence. So I think the chain of custody alone is going to give enough reasonable doubt as to whatever the, uh, that veterinary canine DNA expert is going to testify to, but that's just my opinion. Lauren, thank you so much for um, your super chat. Says, I love your take on this case. I'm baffled. So many people are if they're just starting to deep dive into this. Charlie C., thanks so much for your super chat. I believe the cuts on his arm are from the broken drinking glass, possible defensive wounds. Uh, I don't think they, first of all, they didn't swab his arm at all. They didn't find any glass in his arm. They didn't swab his arm, so his arm tissue could not be tested for canine DNA, just the clothing. And the defensive wounds, um, as to, I don't know, if somebody had a knife, maybe. I don't know. Interesting, though. You think somebody threw the glass at him? I don't know. You think that he broke the glass and then cut him with the glass? That's interesting. Interesting theory. Dave the Pies, love these way wicked accent. Thanks for your super chat. Charlie Lynn, thanks for gifting five memberships. You're amazing. On top, thanks for your super sticker. I appreciate you. And Leanne Wilson, thanks for your super sticker. And Sherry Reed, thank you for your super chat. What caused the FBI to look into this? I'm glad they did, but I have um, missed the... Missed the reason they started their investigation. We don't know. We don't know why they started their investigation. We don't know who the target is. They have not said who the target of this investigation is. It has been theorized by certain people that they may have been investigating some corruption in the district attorney's office 
or some corruption in the Massachusetts State Police, or they may have been investigating the Sandra Birchmore case and the investigation in the Sandra Birchmore case, and they stumbled upon this case. The um, the people who hate Karen Reed and think that she's 100% guilty in this case will tell you that they believe that the investigation was opened at the behest of Karen Reed and her defense counsel, which I just don't think that that's the way that it works. Um, but that's what they would have you believe. So we don't really know. But what we do know is that during a conference call a few months ago between the U.S. attorney for the District of Massachusetts, Josh, Josh Levy, and both counsel, Adam Lally and the defense attorneys, Joshua Levy said, in good conscience, I cannot allow the Karen Reed case to go to trial and I'm going to be opening or submitting or going through the TUI process in order to release to you materials that we have found during our federal investigation of this case. So the TUI process is basic. It's a case that says that the United States government is not allowed to release documents to anybody who is not a party to a case if they are not a party to the case. And TUI is the process or the, the hoops through which they must jump in order to get that evidence. So Josh Levy started the TUI process and I did a stream on this. They released something like 3,000, something like 3,074 pages to both sides. And a lot of that information has become public through the motions that we have heard about and gone over and listened to the hearings. And then the judge again, I think it was just last week, um, after she heard the Boston Globe's motion to unseal a lot of those documents or unimpound them because they call them impounded documents in Massachusetts, we went over a lot of that unimpounded material. So we've gleaned a lot from the federal investigation because they convened a federal grand jury and a lot of the same people testified during the federal grand jury that testified in front of the state grand jury against Karen Reed. So great question. We still don't know what the precipitating factor was to set off this investigation in particular. And I don't know that we will, but we don't know yet. I have questions. Says, Thank you for your super chat. I cannot square the injuries to Officer O'Keefe with a car hitting him. What position is the ADA claiming he was in to receive these injuries? On his knees, leaning over, I have questions. Thank you. Thank you for validating me because there are no injuries to his torso or legs or hip. The only injuries below the neck, according to his autopsy report, which we have not seen in full, but we've seen the photographs and the things that were photographed, Massive laceration to the back of his head, multiple skull fractures, causing two black eyes, a cut on his nose. I'd like to know if his nose was fractured. He has what looked like to be, uh, what appear to be, or what they say are boxers fractures to both hands and the injuries, the lacerations to his right forearm. There are no injuries to his torso or to his legs or to his knees or to his hips. They're just not there. They don't exist. So I have questions too. I just, that's why I don't think this is a motor vehicle accident case. Tracy Ann, thank you. Oh, Lacey Ann, thank you for your super uh, sticker chat. Wouldn't the alcohol test be null if it's proven she really didn't hit John? Well, the jury is the finder of fact here. So since this case seems to be going forward, they're going to have to weigh all the evidence and they are going to have to determine what happened they are going to be the ones to decide whether or not she hit him with her car. Dawn, thank you for gifting five memberships. You are so very generous. All of you, I have to say that despite all of the vitriol that I, that I am uh, subject to on a daily basis on the cesspool of Twitter and even some of the trolls that come into the chat and the comments, uh, building this community with so many of you from Massachusetts has really been very fulfilling because you are not only so generous, but so logical, so passionate about not only your First Amendment rights, but about the rights of a defendant to not be railroaded. Uh, this is so scary. And somebody put in the, the chat before and I started because I wanted to bring this up again. Cheyenne, thank you for this comment. 
says, I'll never forget that female FBI agent saying, who is Karen Reed? And that's what she said on court TV. And I was a guest too. And she said, who is Karen Reed anyway? Why would anybody even want to frame her? And I said, Karen Reed is you. Karen Reed is me. I didn't, maybe I didn't say it on the show. Maybe I said it on my show because on court TV, you can't just say whatever you want. They tell you when you, you know, you're invited to respond. And I didn't say that, but that's exactly why Karen Reed would be framed because she is nobody. Karen Reed is you. Karen Reed is me. Karen Reed is your sister. Karen Reed is my sister. Karen Reed could be your daughter, your mother, your wife. Karen Reed could be any one of us. And because Karen Reed has the money and the ability, the finances to, to defend herself here, that is why this case has gotten as far as it has. Because a person with no resources, with no money, who is in this situation would still be sitting in a jail cell over two years later because they wouldn't be able to afford the cash bail. And that's why this has worldwide attention because this is frightening. It could happen to any one of us. It could happen to any one of us. And that's scary. And when you try and keep people from peacefully protesting outside the courthouse by, by ordering a 200 foot buffer zone around the courthouse, and precluding anyone from wearing any sort of t-shirts or buttons for one side of the other, and even dogs from wearing a sweater that says anything on it about this case, like Free Karen Reed or Justice for JJ, we should all be very afraid that our First Amendment rights are being eroded. Um, and it's interesting, because I came across some photos recently of the Sacco and Vanzetti trial. And there were people with signs outside for both sides, picketing outside the courthouse. It was really interesting to see that. And then to see that now, you know, we wanna keep people away. Um, in my opinion, this is a really, it's a really scary time because once your rights start getting eroded just a little bit, it becomes so much easier for them to be taken away more and more and more. And that's my opinion. But they didn't ask me. Now I just lost myself on the screen. Where did I go? Hello. Well, I can't see what I'm doing. Hopefully you can still see me. Unless I swiped out again. Can you still see me? I'm looking at myself on my phone and I seem to be still there. Swiper, keep swiping. Okay, it's there, but where's my other Chrome browser? Oh, nothing's easy, you guys. Nothing is easy. All right, let's see. Legit. I need a tech person. All right. Well, in the meantime, let's thank some people. Thank you, Jay, for your cash app. And he says the Emmy never swabbed Officer O'Keefe's arm. 100%. Babs says, thank you for the cash app. Can you please read my question that I posted? Well, I would love to if I could find myself back on the screen here. Let's see. Oh, 
oh, I did it. Yay, I did it. All right, Babs. Uh, Babs, I don't know where your question is. I wish you would have put it in the cash app, but I'll try and find it. Can you post it again right now, Babs? If I didn't already read it? Because that may have been a while ago. Elizabeth, thank you for the Venmo. Says, best coverage and mods. You're amazing. AL, thank you for your Venmo. Says, the trial schedule will feature full days in court on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and half days in the... Tuesday, Thursday. Is that what it is? I have to pull it up because I can't really see it. Um, half days are in the morning. So half days are in the afternoons, actually. Amy from Colorado. Scobobs. Scobobs. Thank you, Amy. So very much. So Babs, if you want to put your question back up. That'd be great. All right, we'll get back to those in a moment. Technology is so frustrating, Kimmy. I need a producer. I need a, a back channel. I need people to help me. I just... I'm screaming into a closet all by myself. So if you're on replay, just rewind, uh, just fast forward through that whole debacle that just happened here. <laughs> Fiery features. Thank you so much, Melanie. Just remember you are marvelous. Trolls react when you are telling the truth. There is love for you here. Thank you. Don't let them change you. Oh, thank you so much. No, they won't. They won't. I thought mornings too. I thought she said afternoons. I thought in hell in a handbasket coming in for the win. Uh, I thought it was afternoons. I remember that. She said half day would be mornings. Okay. Um, I don't know. what. Maybe I have uh, early onset dementia, but I could have sworn she said afternoons. And I was excited about that because I, I thought when I am going to go gavel to gavel, afternoons are better anyway. Yeah. Thank you. We are outraged. We are outraged. Jury will not be sequestered as far as I know. It's very expensive to sequester a jury. They are supposed to not watch any news coverage. But um, they're not going to put them in a hotel, as far as I know. Yes, Kirk. Yes, Kirk, 71. Uh, no swabs indicate that John's autopsy was done by photographs and not his physical body. Pictures were of him, not in a gurney, right, uh, but a hospital bed. You're correct. I misspoke. He was not on a gurney. He was on a hospital bed. It was common at Massachusetts at the time. Correct. Everyone thinks it's mornings. I don't know why I had it in my head that it was afternoon. I can go back and listen to that old hearing. Happy 420, beat bits. Happy 420. Jorge Lopez says, I think she backed into him because that's what she said. I think I hear them. I think I hear them. Did I hear them? But what makes it, I think you mean hit him. But what makes it strange is someone in the house was texting. Someone in the house did Google at 227. Uh, how long to die in the cold? And I hit him. I hit him. I hit him. She says, she said it as a question. Like I hit him. I hit him. I hit him. My guess would be that when you show up to the scene and you see your boyfriend dead on the lawn where you last remember seeing him, it would be hard to wrap your brain around the fact that he may have been beaten to a pulp inside the house and dragged back out there. So she was questioning, did I hit him? Because that's the last time that she remember being there. But I am not privy to what's going on in her mind. So I can't say that. But that is, that is exactly what she said. But I think that would be my argument on that. Yeah, Estrella says, I don't trust anything Jen says. Right. So, yeah, Bunker, thanks for your super chat. Melly, indulge me if you will. If Sean McDonough says the feds have everything, is there a possibility that this trial is all theater and a federal trap? Not unless they're they're going to pay her attorney's fees and everything else. But once the jury is sworn in, that is when jeopardy attaches. And so that would be, if the charges were dismissed after the jury is sworn in this case, then double then jeopardy attaches and Karen would not be 
able to be tried again for these same charges or this crime. So we'll see what happens. I've never seen that happen before, but that's an interesting, it's an interesting theory for sure. Uh, Dawn, thanks for gifting memberships. And Jennifer, I'm not sure if we already addressed this, but thanks for your super chat. If the Commonwealth believed it was a car that killed him, they would have swabbed his injuries for paint and plastic fragments. Right. And grease, right? Because if those injuries to his right forearm were caused by being backed over by a vehicle, I'm not sure how they would be so linear. And so, but if they were certain, there would be grease in there, right? Oil, grease, some kind of residue from the car. Shari, thanks for your super chat. Fact, you were the first to say Karen Reed is all of us. I don't know if I was, but that's the way I genuinely feel. Bernie, thank you for your super chat. We adore you, Melanie. Karen is all of us. Thank you. Shari, thanks for your super chat. Again, uh, lots have followed what you said. They didn't cite you. <laughs> it's okay. I'm not looking for any kind of credit, really. I'm just looking. I want people to see what's happening here because in my opinion, this is something that could happen to anybody, and we should all be very, very afraid of that. Suzanne, thank you for your super chat. The Constitution limits the rights of the government, not the rights of the people. That's correct. You are correct. Solomon Landscaping, thanks for your super chat. Love Melanie's channel. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank you for liking it. Uh, Charlie Lynn, thanks for your super chat. Can't wait for the Lopalato testimony. Let's go. That's going to be interesting. And there's some other people on that list. Like, um, you guys tell me, but the, I think the owner of the waterfall bar is on the defense witness list. Her name is escaping me right this second, but hang on a second. And you can let me know. Let me find it in my notes. Bridget Meehan. Bridget Meehan is the owner of the Waterfall Bar. That is my understanding. Can anybody else confirm that for me? Any locals know a Bridget Meehan? Let me know. Oh, is there no jury selection on Monday? Oh, yeah. Jury selection is on Monday. Then they have to perform the Corey checks, right? They're going to have to do the uh, the background checks on the criminal background checks on all the jurors that are seated. And then they have to do openings after that. So you are correct, Robin. Thank you for reminding me. Somebody says, yes, that is correct. Bridget. Bridget. Her, actually, her, her name is spelled B-R-I-G-I-D on the... Um, Witness list, I believe, me in, and she is the owner of the waterfall. Hmm. And John Sr., yes, John O'Keefe Sr. is on the witness list. Me and will be testifying. So that's going to be very interesting. Um, also on the witness list is a woman who was attacked by Chloe and her ex husband. Apparently, she was brutally attacked by Chloe. Right? I've never seen Corey checks done in New York. I don't know if that's a Massachusetts thing, Bob Weir. Bob Weir, thanks for coming in. Um, felons are not allowed to serve on juries. So this is sort of like on the jury questionnaire they had to say if they were ever convicted of a crime and they're trying to see whether any of the jurors are lying. So when will opening start? It depends. It depends on when they're done seating the four additional jurors that they need and when they are done doing those criminal background checks or quarry checks. Sherry Reed, thanks for your super chat. With all the lies and corruption, can she get a fair trial? Jurors are unpredictable, it seems. Makes me worry. I would like to know if her team can make sure she has a truthful and fair trial. Well, we're going to look at the jury questionnaire too. So we will take a look at that. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how a motion for a venue change was never made, but I don't know that anyone in Norfolk County is not familiar with this case because it has divided the town according to certain articles. Thanks, Sherry, for becoming a member. 
Katie, thanks for your super chat. It's frightening them knowing how much power the Norfolk DA's office, especially when no one is watching, how many Karens have they thrown in jail? It's a great point. Leo, we already addressed that one. Amy, thank you for your super chat. Mel, I put a link to an article in the Venmo about mornings. Okay, I believe you. All right, all right, thanks. Thanks, Amy. Amy says mornings, we're gonna go with mornings. Um, MD, thanks for your super chat. How can they explain how his shirt was soaked in blood, yet only six drops found? Excellent cross-examination material. Did the blood make an arch over his neck and face and go straight to his shirt? It's interesting, right? And in order to get vomit in his underwear, if he did start, let's say he had a massive blow to the back of the head, either he was hit with something or fell on top of something. I mean, fell backwards onto something. That would be spewing blood all over the place. And so let's say he started convulsing and throwing up. In order to find vomit in his boxers, wouldn't he have to have been like in a seated position, sort of hunched over and vomited downward? I don't know. Not an accident reconstructionist, but I'm sure there will be one who's going to testify to that. Great points. Kylie, thanks for your super chat. Imagine that lady has arm injuries identical. Yes, that would be interesting, right? Crazy. Crazy. All right, let's take a look at, um, let's find, I want to just show you briefly the motion. Uh, the motion about the obstructed view seats for the jurors and how they want to change the seating in the courtroom. This is a very novel argument, and it seems to be very basic, and I've never seen a motion like this before. And the reason I've never seen a motion like this before is because I've never seen a courtroom set up like this before. I've never seen a courtroom where the uh, the jurors would have an obstructed view of any witness. It's just they're not set up that way. That's why this is really odd. All right. Uh, this is defendant Karen Reed's motion to enforce her constitutional right to face-to-face -face confrontation. Now comes the defendant Karen Reed and respectfully moves this honorable court to enforce her constitutional right to face-to-face -face confrontation by ensuring that all members of the jury can observe the faces of witnesses who testify against her at trial. As grounds for this motion, Ms. Reed states that the courtroom seating arrangements as presently situated would violate Ms. Reed's constitutional right to confrontation because numerous members of the jury will be unable to observe the faces of the witnesses who will testify against her at trial as required by the 6th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution and Article 12 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights and then citing a case, Commonwealth v. Johnson. Argument. The 6th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution and Article 12 of the Massachusetts Declaration of Rights guarantee that a defendant has the right to face-to-face -face confrontation of any witnesses who testify against her at trial. As long held by the Supreme Judicial Court, one of the primary reasons our Constitution requires face-to-face -face confrontation is that it allows the jury to observe the demeanor of the witnesses in order to assess credibility. As the Supreme Judicial Court has explained, in order for the defendant to be able to argue the witness's demeanor to the jury to the extent that it sheds light on credibility, the defendant must be also be able to observe the demeanor of the witness. Thus, the defendant's right to confrontation is violated if either the, def the defendant or members of the jury are unable to observe the demeanor of a witness. The precise reason this type of face-to-face -face confrontation is required is because of widely held beliefs that rec recollection, veracity, and communication are influenced by face-to-face -face challenge. If a witness is sitting face-to-face -face with a defendant but refuses to make eye contact, jurors ob observing this likely will take it into consideration when assessing credibility. A violation of a defendant's constitutional right to confrontation is reversible error. The seating arrangements proposed by this court clearly violate Ms. Reed's constitutional right to face-to-face -face confrontation. Unless the court rearranges the jury box as requested by the defense, at least six of the jurors will only be able to see the back of the witnesses' heads while they testify at trial. 
Thus, at least six members of the jury will be utterly unable to assess the demeanor and credibility of the witnesses that are testifying. The solution initially proposed by the Commonwealth was to force the witness to turn away from the defendant to address the jury. That is not acceptable and creates a separate yet equally problematic constitutional issue by denying Ms. Reed herself the constitutional right to face-to-face -face confrontation. Rather than forcing the witness to face Ms. Reed and allowing all members of the jury to observe the testimony, the witness will effectively be able to choose whether to face Ms. Reed or face only the jurors, avoiding the obligation of face-to-face -face confrontation altogether. Furthermore, the fact that at certain angle, angles, some members of the jury may be able to see part of the profile of the witness's face is of no import. As explained by the Supreme Court in Commonwealth v. Amaral, all arguments about whether the angles permitted a sufficient view of the testifying child's eye and lips missed the point. The witness must give his testimony to the accused's face. As attached here too is Exhibit A, the current seating arrangement in this court denies Ms. Reed her constitutional right to face-to-face -face confrontation by forcing six members of the jury to stare at the back of witnesses' heads while they testify. Ms. Reed has already proposed an alternative seating arrangement, which will allow both Ms. Reed and all members of the jury the ability to observe the witnesses who testify at trial. Any minor inconvenience of rearranging the chairs such that all members of the jury can see the witnesses, can actually see the witnesses, that they testify is not only imminently reasonable, it is constitutionally required. Um, I agree with this premise 100%. But let's take a look at Exhibit A. It's not here, so let's, let me see where it is. Here's Exhibit A. And here's his, uh, this is his affidavit. Oh, I got to switch the screen. Hold on. He, he attaches pictures. He puts himself in the witness stand. He shows the view of what some of the jurors will see if they're seated in these seats over here. Towards the bottom left corner of your screen, you can see that they clearly can only see the back of the witness's head. That's the view from seat number nine. This is the view from seat number 10 again. You can only see the witness, the side of the witness's head and the back of the witness's head. View from seat number 11, obstructed view, as we say in concert terms or baseball terms, or here's the view from seat number 12. Is this even a legitimate court, says Daphne. It's a very old courtroom. Uh, Junkman says, just let him sit at Lally's desk. It's a, it's a weird layout, too, because the prosecution table is in front of the defense table, which I've never seen. Usually they're side by side. This is just a wonky layout for this courtroom. Um, so I think it's, it's, she has to grant this. I mean, she cannot not grant this. The, the jury is the finder of fact. In order to assess credibility, you need to see someone's face. That's just basic 101. You don't need to be a lawyer to make that argument. Um, what say you? I think it's crazy. That is, uh, um, Christopher says, Dedham Superior Court is the smallest courtroom ever, a very old courthouse. It look, it must look bigger in video then because it looks pretty big. It just looks like it has a wonky layout. And then again, he sub supplements it with another affidavit that basically says, I've been in this courthouse, this courthouse, this court. And he goes on about a bunch of trials that he's had in other courthouses, and they've never seen anything like it before this layout. So let's take a quick look at the jury questionnaire so that you can see what they've been asking the jury and what they make them fill out before they start questioning them. <laughs> Gary says, <laughs> Gary says, Bev will just say, this is how we do it in the Commonwealth, denied. That's, uh, he's, I mean, he says in his moving papers, this is reversible error, meaning if you deny this, 
and we go up on appeal, you're going to be reversed. Like it is a basic constitutional right to be able to, for, to be able to confront your accuser face to face. It's basic. Weird. I don't know why anybody ever never brought this up before in that courtroom. Hmm. It's a historic courthouse. I mean, that's crazy. I don't I, I can't believe nobody's ever brought this up before. Hi, Danielle. It says I think Jackson's the first person or attorney to ever recognize the way the jury sits in that courtroom. How crazy is that? That's pretty damn crazy. Estrella says, I agree with you on this. Uh, I don't understand how it's right for the prosecution can be in front of the defense. To me, that says something. I know. It sounds like, you know, it's like they're better. They're not equal. They're not sitting side by side. I don't know. It's kind of weird. Yeah. Oblivious Benson. Hi, Opie. Dang, they got that WrestleMania cheap ticket seating. Yeah. Seems that way. All right. Here's the jury questionnaire. It's been published. It's in the court docket. So we get to look at it. Now, remember, they don't need to find jurors that have never heard anything about the case. They need to find jurors who can keep an open mind despite uh, what they may or may not have heard about the case. So that's what they're looking for. And we still need four more. Number one. And they want you to put your juror number, not your name on there. So that's interesting. Uh, it is alleged that on January 29th, 2022, while intoxicated and operating her motor vehicle in Canton, Massachusetts, the defendant, Karen Reed, killed her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, an off-duty Boston police officer. Is there anything about the description of the case, the charges, or that the victim was an off-duty police officer that causes you to believe you cannot be fair and impartial in this case? And in every question, they have the option to check yes, no, or not sure. Two, do you have opinions regarding previous experience as a juror, the fairness of the jury system or the criminal justice system in our country that would impair your ability to be fair and impartial to both the Commonwealth and to the defendant? Yes, no, not sure. Do you have any religious or philosophical beliefs that would make it difficult for you to follow the law and come to a verdict in this case? Four, reports about this case have been publicized in the media. Do you think you have, a, have read, seen, heard, or discussed anything about this case from any source? Five, this case is expected to garner a significant amount of media attention. Is there anything about the high profile nature of this case that would prevent you from serving as a fair and impartial juror? Six, have you already started to make up your mind about this case? Seven, do you, any family members or close friends reside in or conduct regular business in Canton, Mass? Eight, is there any reason you would be unable to follow an instruction that during your jury service you may not read any news or media accounts about this case, watch or listen to any media or news broadcasts or commentary about this case, discuss this case with your anyone, research or look this case up on the internet or perform independent research. I'm going to break for a second to tell you that in the Maya Kowalski case that we handled out of, or we covered out of Florida, Maya Kowalski against Johns Hopkins All Children's Hospital, it was a civil case, not a criminal case, but the defense, I mean, the the defense, because the hospital was the defendant in that case, attacked juror number one and juror number one's wife and said that juror number one's wife was in YouTube, YouTube chats, watching coverage on the show and that she was commenting on it and it became a whole big thing and they dragged juror number one back into court and made him testify after the $260 million verdict was rendered against the defendant. And that defense pulled many of their legal papers and legal arguments off of Reddit threads. And they tried to discredit that poor juror who wound up being the foreman in the jury and his wife. They wanted access to his cell phones, his wife's cell phones, his Google searches. I mean, it was crazy. So that, that, that question there gave me Kowalski memory vibes. Is there any reason that if you are inadvertently exposed to outside influence or media about this case, you would be unable to follow an instruction that you must report an exposure to the court through a court officer? Would you automatically believe or disbelieve law enforcement, firefighters, or first responders simply because of their occupation? 
Do you have any strong personal beliefs or have you been exposed to any strong personal beliefs from friends and relatives about law enforcement officers, prosecutors, or the government? Have you ever been involved in a group, community, or individual activity such as a march, demonstration, or financial contribution showing support for law enforcement in or outside your own community? That's interesting. Have you ever been involved in a group, community, or individual activity such as, oh, we just read that one. Uh, 15, have you or someone close to you ever had education, training, or work experience in any of the following fields? Law enforcement, military, alcohol or drug abuse, or domestic violence? 16, do you have any strong personal beliefs or have you been exposed to any strong personal beliefs from friends and relatives about operating a motor vehicle under the influence of alcohol? 17, have you ever been involved in a group, organization, participated in a march, demonstration, campaign, or donated money on behalf of an organization or cause that was against driving under the influence of alcohol, such as SAD, Students Against Drunk Driving, or MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving. 18, has anyone close to you ever been involved in an incident involving drinking and driving? If so, would that experience prevent you from being a fair and impartial juror in this case? 19, have you or has anyone close to you been involved in or witnessed a motor vehicle crash? I don't know anybody who could answer like no to that question, but have you... Uh, is there anything about crash reconstruction testimony that would make it difficult for you to be fair or impartial in this case? Have you or any family members or close friends been involved in a domestic violence relationship that featured physical, mental, or verbal abuse? Have you ever been the victim of a violent crime? 23, during trial, you'll hear about medical treatment, death, and review graphic autopsy photographs. Will that affect your ability to participate and be a fair and impartial juror? 24, you may find a defendant guilty based on circumstantial evidence, but you cannot find a defendant guilty based on speculation, guesswork, or surmise. Is it difficult for you to understand the difference between circumstantial evidence, speculation, guesswork, and surmise? 25, do you believe Karen Reed should prove her innocence? And we've been over this before. Karen Reed doesn't have to prove anything. The prosecution has to prove that Karen Reed is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. 26. If the defendant doesn't testify, do you think she's probably guilty or hiding something? 27. Do you know or recognize anyone you have seen today in the courthouse or in the jury pool? 28. Would your answers to any of the above questions be embarrassing or damaging if disclosed publicly, or would disclosure infringe on your privacy? And the last one is 29. Do you have any concerns about your personal privacy due to the presence of video cameras in the courtroom and or the highly publicized nature of this case. Based on their answers to those questions, the, the attorneys can ask them individually questions about certain answers that they give. Alex <laughs> says, they missed asking, can you think? <laughs> That's very interesting. <laughs> Very, very interesting. Um, I don't know if you guys have any questions about that. They seem to be pretty basic, a pretty basic jury questionnaire. But what I want to do now is I want to go back and take a look at that Banfield piece that we were talking about. And I think it was from last night because I found it very interesting. And I think that Ms. Banfield may be seeing the light on some of this. I, I, there are a lot of times I disagree with Ashley Banfield, but when I saw this piece, I was pretty, I was pretty impressed. So let's take a look and you tell me what you think. Not crazy about the title that they chose. It says Karen Reed, Ken, Karen Retrial, can dead cop clear her of murder? I think this was just from last night. Let me know if it was before that. Let me know what you think. Okay, I am not a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> I roll my eyes at the internet a lot. But there was something about that murder case in Boston that I just couldn't shake. And as it turns out, a lot of you feel the same way. 
Uh, it is the Karen Reed trial, a financial analyst and university professor who was hauled in and charged um, that she backed over her boyfriend outside a party and left him for dead in the snow. It's big. The police say that uh, pieces of her tail light were found at the scene covered in her boyfriend's DNA. That's big. And all of that would be so compelling if it weren't for the pesky videotape that shows her tail light wasn't broken when she what? I want to point out that Sean McDonough, retired federal agent Sean McDonough, has been very, very vocal about the taillight. In this case, was on the show, on Ashley's show, I think the night before this. And he didn't get his full time because there was some breaking news. But I'm going to rewind that. So everybody on Twitter is going to be, be accusing Ashley Banfield of drinking the Kool-Aid too. If it weren't for the pesky videotape that shows her taillight, wasn't broken when she drove away from that snowbank. Oh, and there's the condition of her boyfriend too, who is a cop. His injuries seem to tell a whole other tale. And it's a tale more consistent with a conspiracy theory. That the other cops inside the house party where he was dropped off may have actually beaten him to death and then framed Karen Reed for the murder. But don't ask me, ask the victim. Because if you watch Forensic Files, or Quincy back in the day, <laughs> You know that dead men do tell tales. In fact, every injury on a dead man has its very own story. And that's where I bring in Joseph Scott Morgan. He is a certified death investigator, a forensic analyst, and a distinguished scholar at Jacksonville State University and a friend of the show. Okay, JSM, I got a whole list of stuff to go through um, regarding this poor victim's injuries. And I want you to just tell me whether they're consistent with the story the prosecutors um, say. Start with the SUV that uh, the prosecutors claim Karen Reed used to back into him, drive over him and drive off, leaving him in the condition he was in. Do any of his injuries suggest that he was hit by a car? Well, he sustained uh, this blunt force trauma to his head. I suppose that that could, one of the things that we look for actually in pedestrian versus vehicle cases or what are referred to as bumper marks. I haven't heard anybody mention this at all. Joseph Scott Morgan, my savior. This, he's on every news channel, on every single case, all the time. And he is so measured in his responses. And he speaks facts from his many, many years of forensic investigation. And he's not seeing any bumper marks. Praise be is all I can say. Praise be. I've been yelling into a closet for so long. Let's just rewind it a little bit. And look at his credentials. He's a distinguished uh, scholar of applied forensics. He's a professor at Jacksonville State University. He's a forensic analyst and a certified death investigator. He has a very long and storied career. And let's hear what he has to say. Well, he sustained uh, this blunt force trauma to his head. I suppose that that could, one of the things that we look for, Ashley, in pedestrian versus vehicle cases, or what are referred to as bumper marks. I haven't heard anybody mention this at all. Uh, we've got these insults to his arm. I I've thought about this and thought about it. And really, you know, if he doesn't have bumper marks on his legs, which is where you commonly see them, the only posture I can really come up with that he would have been in would be almost in a seated position and kind of throwing your arm up like this and your head striking the ground because that appears to be a laceration and lacerations are not cuts. They're not incised injuries. That's blunt force trauma where you're striking a fixed object. Uh, and again, we don't truly have a descriptor yet. I, I'm, I'm anxiously awaiting to hear what the forensic pathologist has to say on stand. Okay, I'm gonna go rapid fire through the next few and let's just sort of dovetail off on that injury to the head. There's yeah. apparently a two inch gash in his head, but the, the naysayers will say, well, hold on a second. There wasn't a lot of uh, blood at the scene and he's got black eyes and a cut nose, but that two inch gash, shouldn't that have bled out like a lot if he was hit that way? Uh, yeah. I have to keep interrupting for fair use purposes, but yes, Joseph Scott Morgan, DK, in my opinion, has so much credibility. So much credibility. And I don't know if this is the first time anybody's even asked him to opine on the Karen Reed case and the injuries sustained by uh, Officer John O'Keefe, but I'm here for it. 
Uh, generally, and that is surprising, isn't it? Because most of the time uh, with head injuries, you bleed profusely. You know, even we have kids, actually. I know you do. I do. And if a kid gets his head split open, you see a lot of blood with that. And that is curious. I don't know if the cold impacted that or if perhaps it had occurred in another location, but there should have been a cope. Or perhaps it occurred in another location, copious amounts of blood. Copious amount of blood at the scene, I would think. Yeah, I, I took my uh, one-year-old baby to, to the hospital. He cut his nose on the, uh, the coffee yep. table. I looked like Carrie. I mean, I was head to, it, you're right. These head yeah, the injuries so are vascular, just, wow. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the other thing you, you mentioned that the, the injuries on his arm, the naysayers uh, say those look like dog bites um, and that there was a dog that was, uh, you know, homed in that house party. What mm -hmm. do you make of the marks on his arm? Well, they're linear, very linear. As a matter of fact, they have kind of a uniformed appearance to them. I've seen injuries that are similar to this in motor vehicle strikes what, that generally mm -hmm. derive from the underside of the vehicle. But here's the problem. I'm not interested in those injuries on his arm. What I'm interested in are his clothing. I want to know what happened to the clothing because that's where the tail of the tape is truly going to be. If he went under that car, there's going to be road debris, grease perhaps. And if, you know, this, this dog incident, you would be able to recover perhaps some pet hair off of it. And let's assume that he was in the house and he was layered. It doesn't necessarily have to be on his jacket. It could be on an undershirt, perhaps. But we haven't heard anything mm -hmm. about the clothing. And for us in forensics and death investigation, the clothing is where we start. It's a layered investigation, literally. Okay, I have 30 seconds for two things. That's the taillight. Would backing into uh, a man smash the taillight? Because we've got a guy who's an expert who says he's called the Lexus company and they've said not a chance. And then on top of that, He's got, you know, injuries like a, a fight. He's got injuries on it on his uh, hands. Yeah, first off, the tail light. It would. It's high impact plastic. You would need a significant strike. There would have to be uh, a, a good good amount of speed. And in mm, interesting, interesting. For those who say that a soft body could shatter a tail light, he says no order to accomplish that task, in my opinion. That's what I as thought. far as the hands, if those hands are fractured, uh, in particular, uh, he may have been putting up a fight. Uh, but with the bruises on the hands, I would expect to see some kind of uh, scrapes or something like that, in addition to the bruising on the hands, because that, that happens a lot as well. Yeah. Or maybe he got into a fight inside that house. Maybe the defense is right. Okay, Joseph Scott Morgan, thank you. I raced through that and I'm out of time, but I'm going to have you back. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ash. Thank you for watching. Okay. What say you? I don't know. Sean, did you flip Ashley? Um, James Lynch, those are definitely dog bites. I thought that that was uh, a very interesting piece, unlike anything I've seen from News Nation in quite some time. Let's say you. Peter Estrada, I don't think it's impact plastic. I think it's polycarbonate, so actually quite brittle, but I don't know for sure. Uh, I don't know either, but we are going to find out We are going to find out. And lucky we trust. Sounds like Ashley has at least reasonable doubt. There you go. Yeah, poly it is polycarbonate, right, Jimmy? That's very hard to shatter. I think Sean went over this on his channel. And he went to a Lexus dealer and even checked it out. He's been investigating this case for like 15 hours a day for like uh, over a year. Him and his fellow retired law enforcement friends in case i didn't already thank you marianne thank you so much for your vmo and says great show thanks for breaking it all down for us uh and anonymous anon please thank you so much for your very very generous vmo 
Elizabeth, thank you. Best, uh, best coverage, she says. And there's also, Amy sent me an article, which I cannot pull up right now because they do not let me. Oh, look, she sent me the article that says full days, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and a half days in the morning on Tuesday and Thursday. All right. Looks like we're getting up early, uh, East Coasters, where we're going to be listening. <laughs> you guys are going to be listening at work. And Nancy, thanks. And JL, thank you. Very generous. Marianne, AL, and Elizabeth, thank you all so very much. Um, my mother always taught me to write thank you notes. So I have to thank everybody who's, who, who supports the channel because, uh, you're so much more supportive than the, the twits that seem to just want to discredit me, trash me, whatever. I don't care. DK, thanks for being a member. It just appears there's so much corruption attached to this case. I'm concerned about the jurors that were picked. What are the chances that the jury pool was stacked with Commonwealth friendly people? Well, hopefully they're all doing their due diligence and their questioning and they're going to be able to find out. If anybody has bias and they're going to be able to find 16 people in the county of Norfolk that are going to be able to sit with an open mind and wait for the evidence before they make a decision. London Recluse, thank you for your super chat. I want to see every moment of this trial, but I can't abide the thought of having to spend so much time listening to Lally. Uh, the size, the size. I hope the audio is good. I hope there's not all that heavy breathing into the mic. Just me. Thanks for your super chat. J.O. wasn't identified as law enforcement in jury instructions. What if they are pro or con law enforcement bias? I thought the very first question says uh, that he was law enforcement. And do you have a problem with that? I'm just going to go back to that question. It does. It says the very first question says that uh, the defendant, Karen Reed, the Commonwealth is alleging, killed her boyfriend, John O'Keefe, an off-duty Boston police officer. So they actually did. Uh, put that in there right away. So thank you for that. Lisa says, thanks for the super chat, Lisa. Who had the authority to drop the charges on Karen Reed when it became apparent there was evidence showing her innocence? Did Lally have the authority or only DA Marcy? Well, the DA is in charge of the entire DA's office. So the end result or decision would be up to him. And um I think a lot of people would question whether there's evidence proving her innocence. I think a lot of people think she 100% did it because they don't like her smirks, apparently. We keep saying to all these people that are, well, I don't, because I don't engage with the twits, but show me the evidence that she, he was hit by her car. Just show me that evidence because I don't see it. Kylie, thank you. Thank you so much. And Renee for becoming a member and Jane for becoming a member. If you have questions, please put some question marks or something in front of your question. And I'm going to go to the chat for questions one last time to see if there is anything else that you guys would like to talk about today. We have 21, over 2,100 people watching, which would, would, would be so amazing if you guys would hit the like button because it really helps the YouTube, al YouTube algorithm push the, the stream out. And what would be even more awesome is if you would just hit the subscribe button, it's free. And then if you hit the bell, it will let you, it'll notify you when I go live because I don't have a set schedule. And then you will never miss a thing. And you don't want to miss a thing because this is going to be really one of the most interesting trials in my mind that we have covered in a very, very long time. I've only had this channel for nine months, so I have not covered a lot of trials with you, but I do follow trials and I have filed trial, followed trials for quite some time. And this is one of the most interesting cases that I've ever followed. So I'd like to know what your <laughs> thoughts are on that as well, because it is, it's getting crazy. It's getting hot in here. Question, question, question. Is the DA elected there? He is. It is an election year. I don't know when his term is over, but he has been elected. He has run unopposed, I think. He has been in office since 2010. We went over his uh, resume one day. He is a lifelong politician and he has had other, he's held other positions in addition to, to being the district attorney prior to being the district attorney, but he's been in office since 2010. Colleen, thank you. Question, shouldn't Annie Bev be sanctioned be sanctioning the Commonwealth for turning over evidence 
the other day that was due in August 2022. Interviews with C and J Albert and some reports. You know, the defense has asked for sanctions quite a lot of times and they have been denied quite a lot of times. So we've seen it and she's never sanctioned them before. So what she should do and what she does do are two completely different things. In my experience and opinion, Virginia says, anybody else notice that Marcy seems to be MIA? And lucky we trust. Excellent question. Since Marcy's on the witness list, does that mean he can't watch ever any coverage? He's not supposed to. None of the witnesses are supposed to watch any coverage and none of the witnesses are supposed to sit in the courtroom or allowed to sit in the courtroom during the trial if they're going to be called as a witness until after their testimony is finished. So yeah, that's interesting. One to one, Islanders Kane, second, two minutes left in the second. Is that recent? I don't have a timestamp on here, but okay, that's cool. Um, and we can get off for third period. <laughs> How about that? I can't read your name. Uh, Wybenlieb, what about Brian Higgins returning to 34 Fairview? I don't know about that. I'm sure he's going to be cross-examined about that. Jenny, have you ever seen the defense called the DA as a witness? Not in my personal experience. It's very interesting. But in my opinion, he inserted himself into this case when he made that video and published it back in August and told everyone that Michael Proctor never went to the scene on the date of the accident or the date of the incident and that Colin Albert was never in the house. And he professed innocence for all of those people who were in the house, uh, in my opinion, he made himself a witness by inserting himself into this case and making that video. So let me know what you think about that. But that's my opinion. He doth protested too much. That's what I say. <laughs> Stephanie says, I can't wait for Melody to imitate Morrissey after he testifies. That's great. Uh, you know what? There were some additional... After Murdoch, I said no more, but here I am, says Brenda. Kate Lewis, have car electronics been investigated? Lexus would have been beeping wildly if about to hit something. Plus, people are saying Lexus had automatic braking system. Yes, I've, I've heard that as well. It's going to be interesting to hear the experts testify. Much of this may be battle of the experts, as in most uh, criminal trials involving a lot of forensic evidence. But yes, they have been analyzed. Marcy has been seen in local bars, says Janie. Who will prosecute the McAlberts when Karen's exonerated? One thing at a time. One thing at a time. We'll see what happens here. Or if anybody else is even going to be able to be indicted. Because, uh, you know, unless there's eyewitnesses who are going to testify, it could be hard now. Um, the defense's evidence list. Did that come out yet? Because I haven't seen it. If it's out, I, I, I'd like to do to meet again tomorrow. Let's convene again tomorrow because I want to also go over a couple of exchanges that the Commonwealth just did. Um, so let me know if you'd rather come back tomorrow afternoon or evening. What is most convenient for most of you? Let's see. The Rangers are playing tomorrow at 3 p.m. So we can't interfere with that. It may have to be tomorrow evening. Um, and I'm assuming the Bruins and the Islanders will not be playing since they are playing today and tonight. So tomorrow evening might be best for that. Marcy's current term ends 2016. He runs in a post. Well, it, we're past 2016. Are you meaning are you 2026? Is that a typo, Colleen? This is why your local, your local elections are very, very, very important, my friends. Very, very important. Thank you, Lynn, for the Venmo. Thank you so much. Um, your local elections are important, 2026. Okay. Sandy says also her smirk could be there because of MS. Yeah, great point. Uh, we do have the witness list. We went over that on the last stream. So go back for that. Uh, I do have some additional information on some of these additional witnesses. So let me just pull that up for one second. And you can tell me because in addition to finding out that one of the witnesses is actually the owner of the waterfall bar. That's interesting. 
did they go into the waterfall to see if and to match to see if they could match that drinking glass? You know, what they never did was they never went into the house of 34 Fairview to see if they had those kind of drinking glasses in the house. And you know what else they never did? Unless someone else has information, please, if there's anybody who knows the answer to this question, please. I have this burning question. Did anybody test that drinking glass that they found next to Officer O'Keefe's body for DNA and or fingerprints? Did anybody that was the glass tested? Uh, we know that the taillight pieces that were found some 12 hours later were tested for DNA. But was that drinking glass tested? I, I need to know the answer to that question. And if not, why not? I'll let you guys uh, answer that in the chat if you would. Um, these are my own personal notes, so they are not to be relied on as 100% accurate, but there were some additional people that I was able to identify thanks to my armchair detectives in the chat. They are... Yeah, Bridget Meehan, right here, number 83. Owner of the Waterfall Bar and Grill. She's on both witness lists. Uh, and here, on the on the defense witness list, Michael Wagner and Cheryl Waugh, W-A-U-G-H. Uh, I wrote here, ex-wife and dog brutally attacked by Chloe, and Cheryl was attacked by Chloe. Uh, there may be some of the, some other people in this list may also be could because remember Chloe attacked two other people after this. So I am interested. And Patrick Haggerty, number 27, I believe is the owner of Diamond Towing in Dighton that may have towed that vehicle. So let me know if you know the answer to that. And if there are any other witnesses on there that I don't have little red um, notes in front of that you know who they are that we have not yet identified. Somebody said, "What? who do I look forward to? Chat has kind of like stopped. It's weird. Like on my end, it's not running right now. Very strange. The last thing I have in here is 6.48 p.m. Mindy saying someone needs to run against him. I don't know if YouTube is glitching right now. Very strange. What witnesses' testimony do you look forward to hearing the most? I can't wait to hear from the people who live in the house. Brian Albert, Nicole Albert. I want to hear from Jim McCabe. I want to hear from a lot of witnesses who changed their story throughout the course of this investigation and the course of this case. It interests me. We'll be here for it. All right. I will see you tomorrow evening. Make sure you have notifications set for all notifications so you'll know or just keep checking back to my channel page so that you'll know when we're going to go live tomorrow evening to discuss some of the things that we did not get to today. Thank you to my moderators for making this chat a very, very classy place to be and for wanting to help me out so very much because you do. I know how hard you work and I appreciate you so much. And to my channel members for wanting to be part of my community and this community. Thank you so much because you are the guys who make it special. I love you all so, so very much. My viewers, replay viewers, please just hit the like button. Do all the things that YouTube likes to push the algorithm out and the analysis of this case out. And remember, my friends, as I always say, be cool, be kind, be classy. It's not hard, really. Really, it is so not hard. Try it. <laughs> you might find it's pretty easy to do. I don't understand why so many people find it so hard, but I know you guys can do it. Good night, everyone. I'll see you tomorrow night. And let's go, Rangers. Peace.